gather round, boys and girls and others, because it's time to embark upon a terrifying journey of ghoulies, monsties, and bloodthirsty psychopaths. Are you afraid? Because you darned well ought to be. <laughs> <coughs> oh, sorry about that. I think I've got something stuck in my throat. Where were we? Oh, yes. The Spookums. The world of video games can be a delightful place, full of stunning artwork, exciting action, and friendly characters. But it can also be a place where all of your worst nightmares come to life. Alas, it turns out that some players actually really enjoy it when a game is able to give them a genuine fright, and there are even those that seek out the horror on purpose. Crazy. For today's big list, then, we're taking a look at a number of moments, 101 to be exact, where video games have chilled us to our very bones, leaving us unable to sleep at night for fear that the boogeyman, or bogeyman if you're in a British about this, in whatever form it may take, might come and get us. Before we get to the entries, we'd probably better establish the rules of engagement, hadn't we? With the help of our wonderful community, we've trawled through all of gaming history to find the spookiest moments from everyone's favourite time titles, be they of horror persuasion or otherwise. We must impress upon you the fact that these entries are in no particular order, which means the entry in the number one spot is not inherently any more or less terrifying than the entry in the 101st spot. We've also decided not to limit ourselves to just one entry per game this time, as some titles had numerous frightful moments and we found it far too difficult to narrow it down. Since this is a list about scary goings-on, we should warn you now that there may be discussions of uncomfortable topics, though we will endeavour to warn you before covering anything that might be upsetting. We're sticking a general death, violence, gore and unsettling scenes warning right here though, just in case. Finally, due to the nature of this list, we will need to discuss major plot points, so a spoiler warning is very much in effect. Lock the doors, close the curtains, and don those brown trousers, because I'm Ben. I'm Peter. And I'm Ashton from Triple Jump, and here are the 101 scariest video game moments of all time. Number 101. Mr. X makes himself known. Resident Evil 2 and Resident Evil 2 Remake. We're starting this list off strong, and by strong I mean able to lift a smouldering helicopter with his bare hands strong. Resident Evil 2 and its remake are, in and of themselves, pretty scary games, maintaining a level of tension throughout that ensures that players can never truly feel at ease. Every so often, though, the dial is cranked up to 11, and as such we get moments like this one that have us utterly plopsing ourselves. As Leon and Claire make their way around the RCPD station trying to avoid bloodthirsty T-virus infected zombies, they're interrupted by a loud crashing noise. They later find that it's more than just shoddy architecture to blame, and the sound is actually caused by a visitor, and if they think think the infected horde is bad, just wait until they get a load of this guy. Rounding a corner, they come face to face with Tyrant, aka Mr. X, a humongous trench-coated bioweapon whose directive is simply to wipe out anyone who might tattle about Umbrella's misdeeds. The moment that Mr. X reveals himself, both in the original game and the remake, is utterly terrifying and undoubtedly saw players' anxiety levels going through the roof as they realised that this utter monstrosity was out to get them and would stop at nothing until he succeeded. What? What's that thumping noise? James, is that you? Number 100. You can run, but you can't hide. Alien Isolation. In space, no one can hear you scream. This is known to be true, since space is a vacuum and sound can't travel through a vacuum. My living room, on the other hand, is not a vacuum, and I can assure you that people very much heard me screaming the first time I played Alien Isolation. The neighbours still won't talk to me. Generally speaking, the best way to avoid the xenomorph in Alien Isolation is to steer clear of it as far as possible, and a good hiding spot is more valuable than gold dust. Many players probably thought that they were onto a winner when they found a locker to hide in as the first time they slipped amongst the dirty gym socks and posters of Justin Timberlake the xenomorph moseyed right on by. The next time, however, might have been a different story. Indeed, Alien Isolation somewhat lulls players into a false sense of security by making them think that they're safe from said alien whilst hiding. The beast is far more advanced than most players give it credit for, though, which many found out the hard way when it sniffed them out before tearing them from their confinement and rapidly unaliving them, as the Gen Zers would say. You do get somewhat used to the feeling of never being safe, but the first time your hiding spot is discovered, it's bloody terrifying. Number 99. The Night Folk. Red Dead Redemption 2. 
Red Dead Redemption 2 isn't, in general, a scary game. It has its tense moments, for sure, but it isn't a spooky title. That doesn't stop it from touching on the utterly horrific, though, and the first of our picks from Rockstar's Rootin' Tootin' Shootin' sequel is Players Encounter with the Night Folk. Red Dead players can find the Night Folk, if they dare, in and around the swamps of Bayou Noir and Blue Water Marsh, though purposefully seeking them out is probably ill-advised. Unlike traditional bandits who will set upon their victims, rob them, and head on their merry way, the Night Folk are vicious, trapping those who they come across before robbing them and then murdering them in horrific ways. They can often be found carrying the corpses of their victims, and mutilated bodies litter their dwellings like macabre decorations. At night, the swamps of Red Dead Redemption 2 are already spooky enough, shrouded in darkness, moonlight, and fog, all of which can conceal hungry alligators, but when you throw into the mix a tribe of bloodthirsty, possibly cannibalistic psychopaths, you've got yourself a recipe for a seriously bad time there, friend. There's little wonder that only the bravest of players dare venture down to the bayou after night falls, and if you are planning a jaunt there yourself, make sure you've got plenty of ammo. You're going to need it. Number 98. The Mask Transformation Scream. The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. Prior to the turn of the millennium, the Legend of Zelda series had always been pretty bright, colourful, and light-hearted. Yes, there were one or two scary moments, don't worry, we'll get to those in a bit, but on the whole, the games weren't exactly spooky. Then along came Majora's Mask, a title with an altogether creepier aesthetic, and good gravy does it bring the scares. Our first pick for this list is actually several moments from the game, though they're all equally as disconcerting as one another. The story of Majora's Mask sees Peter Pan cosplayer Link embroiled in a quest to save the parallel universe of Termina from a frankly terrifying fate. The game introduced a number of new gameplay concepts to the series, including a three-day time loop and Link's ability to use masks to transform into different beings. One issue, though, is that the transformation process is absolutely horrifying. When Link puts on a mask, the screen goes dark. We hear eerie cracking sounds, followed by a noise that sounds like a gunshot, and Link lets out a blood-curdling scream, indicating that the transformation is either mentally or physically excruciating. What's worse is that players have to go through this every time Link puts on a mask. It's a cool mechanic and all, but did they have to make it so gosh darn terrifying? Number 97. The Child's Room. Layers of Fear. We're going from games from our childhood to childhood bedrooms now as we take a look at Layers of Fear, the 2016 psychological horror title developed by Bloober Team. The game sees players take on the role of an artist as he struggles to complete his magnum opus, and they must explore his home to slowly uncover the events that have led his psyche to fracture. As players wander the halls, it becomes clear that not all is as it seems. Scenes will shift when you look away, doors will open by themselves, and if you enter a room, you just know something's going to go down. The most chilling encounter in the game, however, takes place in the nursery, where the artist is forced to come to terms with the fact that his actions have led to the loss of his family. Throughout Chapter 4, the artist is confronted by a series of images and objects that remind him of his daughter, from drawings on the walls to creepy animated dolls, all of which lead him to his daughter's room. Upon first entering, the room seems pleasant enough, but after interacting with the music box in the center, things get spooky. The room shifts from bright and colourful to dark and scary, the toys come to life, and the music becomes eerie. Ultimately, the room fades away and the artist is left alone with ever-approaching doll parts and an unnerving poem before things go back to normal in an instant. Trust me, you'll never look at a music box the same way again. Number 96. Meeting Hartman. Control Awe. We gamers love a good crossover. Super Smash Bros, Mortal Kombat vs DC Universe, Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games. Music to our ears. There are some crossovers, however, that should never have seen the light of day, not because they're not any good, but because one spooky property plus another spooky property equals double the spookums of being the sensitive souls that we are here at Team Triple Jump. We just can't handle it. One such crossover is Control DLC Or, which introduces elements from Alan Wake to the game. Or takes place after the events of Alan Wake and sees Control protagonist Jesse Faden attempt to destroy Hartman, the twisted abomination that was once Alan's psychiatrist. At the end of Alan Wake, Hartman drove into cold Lake and was possessed by the dark presence before being captured by the Bureau and brought to the old house, where he proceeded to breach containment, forcing the Bureau to abandon the sector in which he was kept. After being summoned by Alan, Jesse heads to the sector to rid it of Hartman, but although players had an entire game's worth of supernatural experience by this point, nothing could have prepared them for their first encounter with the monstrosity. Whilst riding the elevator, everything goes dark, and Jesse is greeted by a distorted voice that tells her Hartman was stretched before coming face to face with his new form in a moment that's absolutely horrifying. I think I'll sleep with the lights on tonight just in case. Thank you very much. Number 95. Nibelheim Rebuilt. Final Fantasy VII. 
We've discussed what a complete douche canoe Sephiroth is at great length on this channel, but I don't think we've ever talked about how he's basically responsible for one of the creepiest moments in Final Fantasy VII, the moment that Cloud and Tifa return to Nibelheim, only to find that no one remembers them. Nibelheim, located at the base of Mount Nebel, is hometown of Cloud Strife and Tifa Lockhart, but is ultimately burned down by Sephiroth, who has been driven mad by the discoveries he has made about his mother, Genova. During the incident, both Cloud's mother and Tifa's father lose their lives. Many years later, Cloud and Tifa return to Nibelheim, only to find that it looks exactly like it did before it was burned down. Suspecting something to be wrong, the two explore and speak to the townsfolk who insist that the destruction never took place. In addition, none of them recognize Cloud or Tifa, and the place is littered with hooded figures who chant about Sephiroth. The reason for things being so weird is that Shinra has rebuilt the town and replaced its citizens with fakes in order to cover up what Sephiroth did, but knowing that doesn't make the experience any less spooky. Although the sequence won't frighten and players out of their skin, it certainly leaves them feeling incredibly uneasy. Number 94. The Man in the Wheelchair – Outlast are you tired of your blood pressure not being through the roof? Sick of sleeping soundly at night? Had enough of not being crippled by anxiety? Then you should play Outlast, the 2013 stealth horror game that our writer only managed to stick with for about 30 minutes because it's so darned tense. Players step into the shoes of Miles Upshur, a freelance investigative journalist who sets out to uncover the truth of what's going on at Mount Massive Asylum, a psychiatric hospital owned by the notoriously unethical Murkoff Corporation. Once in the facility, however, he finds that things are much, much worse than he could have ever imagined, as the inmates have taken over the asylum, and not just in a figurative sense. The first big scare comes just a few moments into the game and sets the tone for what's to come. As Miles begins his investigation, he's faced with a corridor in which a man in a wheelchair is situated. Players familiar with horror titles will no doubt have clocked the man and thought, ah yes, a jump scare, you can't get me that easily, Outlast. Eyes trained on the man, they'll have approached, sphincters clenched, only to find that he does nothing. Huh. A fake out. They potter into the next room, grab the keycard they need, and then saunter back down the corridor, confident that the man means them no. Oh my god, he's attacking! Nurse! Number 93 Simon's Fate. Soma. Oh boy or girl or other, would you look at the time? It's existential crisis o'clock. Better welcome in the anxiety and contemplate the futility of life for a bit. Oh. That's the stuff. If you're looking to avoid having your own existential crisis, then it's probably best not to play Soma, or Soma, if you want to get rather loud about this, from studio Frictional Games, who are well known for crafting terrifically scary survival horror titles. Soma largely takes place in a remote underwater research facility in which Simon Jarrett, our protagonist, finds himself under mysterious circumstances. After making contact with a woman named Catherine, Simon learns that it is the year 2104, and Pathos 2, the underwater facility, is the last known outpost of humanity. Catherine's mission is to recover the Ark, the only means for anything of human origin to leave Earth, and Simon agrees to assist her in retrieving it. In the end, it turns out that the Ark contains brain scans of the former Pathos 2 crew members, and that it was never a means for Simon to escape at all. Catherine uploads scans of hers and Simon's brains to the Ark, and it's shuttled into space, leaving Simon alone in the abyss whilst alternate versions of he and Catherine get to reunite elsewhere. Try not to keep yourself awake mulling over all of the implications of that one. Number 92. Your first witch encounter. Left for Dead. Right, you can snap out of it now, we've got zombies to deal with. Left 4 Dead is Valve's first-person shooter set shortly after a zombie outbreak, and sees its four protagonists, Bill, Zoe, Lewis, and Francis, attempting to survive the hordes of infected. Sadly, not all zombies are created equal, and whilst the standard infected are pretty fearsome in large numbers, they're nothing when compared to the game's boss creatures. With that said, though the boomer, hunter, smoker, and tank are all horrifying in their own ways, not one is a patch on the terror that consumes players when they encounter a witch. If you're really careful, you can avoid antagonizing one of these ladies, as when undisturbed, they'll keep themselves to their hideous, wailing selves. Sadly, it doesn't take much to set them off, and the first time you do, you're going to be scared out of your tiny little mind. These ferocious foes don't just look horrendous, they're also the most powerful enemies in the game, and on harder difficulties can kill the player character in just one hit. Ignoring the crying woman is a lesson that most players learned very, very quickly, though I suppose you would too if the alternative was a horrible death. Moral of the story, leave the sobbing ladies the heck alone, yeah? Number 91. The Colonel Loses It. Metal Gear Solid 2. Sons of Liberty. 
AI can be really, really useful, helping us to remember the things we might normally forget, answering questions so that we don't have to go to the trouble of googling them, and assisting with mundane tasks like setting timers for us so we don't accidentally burn our pizza. When it goes wrong, though, things can get a bit creepy, and no one knows that quite as well as Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty protagonist Raiden. Throughout the game, Raiden receives communications from the Colonel, who is alleged to be his commanding officer. What he actually is, is a combination of GW's AI and Raiden's expectations of former Foxhound commander Roy Campbell, and because GW had been able to access Campbell's brain through the use of nanomachines, they were able to utilise his memories and Raiden is unable to spot the difference. When Emma Emmerich uploads the virus to Arsenal Gear's systems, however, the Colonel begins acting very strangely indeed, glitching out and rambling about utter nonsense. This is another entry where the experience won't leave players utterly terrified, but it's incredibly strange and entirely unnerving, and has us wondering just what sort of unhinged things Alexa might say if ever her software got corrupted. You know what, I think I might unplug her just to be safe. Number 90. The Iron Maiden, Resident Evil 4 and Resident Evil 4 Remake. Of all the games in the Resident Evil series, 4 is one of the less scary ones, with developer Capcom having opted to focus more on the action and less on the spooks. With that said though, it isn't entirely devoid of frightening moments. Case in point, player's first interaction with an Iron Maiden. No, not that one. The Iron Maidens are a species of bioweapon derived from the Regenerators, which are in and of themselves pretty horrific. In the original Resident Evil 4, these pointy lads are easily identifiable, and although they look somewhat similar to the Regenerators, they're covered in thorns and have a face that only a mother could love. In the remake, however, they initially look exactly like the Regenerators, only showing their true spiky colours once they've experienced a bit of lead poisoning. If how they look isn't enough to put the willies up you though, then the fact that they're incredibly fast, even without the use of their legs, and have the ability to shoot long barbs from their skin definitely will be. Despite what Leon has to say about it, this is one video game monstie that you certainly wouldn't want to cuddle. Not unless you suddenly want to acquire a whole bunch more body piercings, that is. Number 89. The Guardians Awaken. The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword. You might not think that a game that requires you to wave a Wiimote in the air like you just don't care could be capable of being particularly scary, but if you do think that, then clearly you haven't experienced the horror that is Faror's trial in The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword. Indeed, we all remember Shigeru Miyamoto's attempt to make Skyward Sword work properly at E3 2010, but it turns out that the game had far more horrors lying in wait than just the odd bug here and there. Whilst in in the Silent Realm, players undertake a challenge to collect a number of tears, which are used to fill the spirit vessel that will allow them to escape. However, the trial is a test of their courage, and they must be careful to ensure that Link avoids the guardians that litter the landscape, or else his spirit will be shattered and the trial will be failed. The trial is ridiculously tense, and players must stay constantly focused in order to stay out of the way of the utterly horrifying guardians, because if they don't, they're going to wind up regretting it, as no amount of Wiimote waggling is going to be able to save them. Seriously, isn't this game supposed to be for kids? Why does it have levels that can make a full-blown adult cry? Uh. Number 88. Laura, The Evil Within most of you will know master of video game horror Shinji Mikami for creating the Resident Evil series, but he's also responsible for the spooks in The Evil Within and its sequel. Admittedly, the duo of titles aren't the very best horror games ever made, but they do provide players with plenty of scary moments, like the one in the first game where we meet Laura. In The Evil Within, players take control of police sergeant Sebastian Castellanos, as he and his colleagues investigate the scene of a mass murder at Beacon Mental Hospital. However, the situation goes from bad to worse when the cops are pulled into a nightmarish world filled with monstrous, murderous creatures, including the subject of this entry. In life, Laura was the sister of Ruvik, the game's chief antagonist, but died in a fire set by the local farmers who were angry with Laura and Ruvik's parents. Ruvik created Stem as a way to live out the life he yearned for with his sister, but when his employer discovered it, they claimed it for themselves. Alas, STEM only functions using Ruvik's brain, 
and as such, he is able to unleash all kinds of horrors upon the world. The Laura that players meet is a tragically distorted version of Rubik's sister, warped by his need for vengeance. Gnarled, twisted, and possessing far more limbs than she should have, Laura is an utterly horrifying sight to behold, and what's more is, she can't even be killed using regular bullets. I guess I'll just, I'll just lie down and die then, you know what, I, I give up. Number 87. The Matchmaker's Lair – Condemned Criminal Origins when people talk about great horror games, it's very rare that Condemned Criminal Origins gets a mention, which is a shame, really, because it's a mightily atmospheric title and is definitely worth a look if you're a fan of serial killers. Well, not a fan of serial killers, but you know what I mean. The story follows FBI agent Ethan Thomas, who's embroiled in a case concerning The Matchmaker, a serial killer who targets young women and poses their corpses alongside mannequins. Whilst on The Matchmaker's trail, however, Ethan himself is framed for murder, and he winds up on a quest to clear his name. His hunt for answers eventually leads him to the Matchmaker's Lair, which is located in a department store, and if you thought that the rest of the game was scary, just wait until you feast your eyes on the absolute hellscape that is the Matchmaker's Lair. Dark, decrepit, and crawling with folks who'd love nothing more than to fill it, Ethan, this department store is about as far removed from Harrods as you could possibly imagine. What's worse, though, is that it's nigh on impossible to tell the difference between the mannequins and the real people, so players will find themselves constantly on edge as they try to determine what's trying to kill them and what's just trying to model a snazzy jumper. Number 86. Scissor Man – Clock Tower Perhaps the only thing scarier than Clock Tower's chief antagonist, Scissorman, is the naming conventions of the series. Why are the first two games both called Clock Tower, and why is the third game called Clock Tower 2? And what's any of this got to do with Clock Towers anyway? The first Clock Tower title introduces players to the Scissorman. But whilst his name might not sound particularly frightening, the man himself is quite the fearsome foe. Clock Tower centers on orphan Jennifer Simpson, who, alongside several other children, is adopted by wealthy recluse Simon Barrows. Unfortunately for the kids, there isn't going to be a happily ever after, and not long after arriving at Barrows' mansion, one of the children is killed, and Jennifer finds herself stalked by the Scissor Man. Now, a small child carrying a large pair of scissors shouldn't be all that scary, but the surprising emergence of Scissor Man, coupled with the atmosphere created by the soundtrack, track and setting of the game makes him a truly unsettling antagonist. He goes on to terrorize Jennifer for the remainder of the game, keeping players anxiety-ridden throughout. See, this is why you shouldn't give sharp objects to kids. None of this would have happened if he'd only had access to a pair of those plastic paper scissors. Number 85. The First Sin – The Forgotten City for many, being stuck in a time loop would be something of a nightmare in and of itself, so imagine how scary it would be to be stuck in a time loop in which doing bad things might set off a bunch of murderous statues. Originally developed as a mod for Skyrim before getting a release of its own, The Forgotten City sees the player character transported thousands of years into the past to a city under the protection of the gods. The caveat of said protection is that no citizen may commit sin lest the wrath of the gods rain down upon them. Sadly, no one knows what constitutes a sin and what doesn't, and so everyone's a bit uptight. Alas, you've got a sin to win in this game, though the first time that the gods are upset is pretty darn scary. Should a sin be committed, the golden statues that are dotted around the place come to life and begin attacking the player as the remaining inhabitants of the city are transformed into statues themselves. Naturally, you get used to this after a while, but the first time you hear that thunderous voice declare, The many shall suffer for the sins of the one. It's sure to send a shiver down your spine. I guess you better be on your best behavior from now on, hey? Number 84. Meeting Lisa, P.T. Despite the fact that P.T., the playable teaser for Silent Hills, is filled to the brim with sights and sounds that have the power to absolutely terrify players, perhaps the scariest thing about it is the fact that the game it was teasing will never be released. Unfortunately, we're limiting ourselves to in-game horrors for this list, and as such, we can't include Hideo Kojima's messy breakup with Konami. 
So our alternative PT pick is the first time that players come face to face with the lovely Lisa. PT focuses on the misadventures of an unnamed protagonist who finds himself trapped in a haunted house with a corridor that constantly loops back on itself. While traversing the creepy hallway, the protagonist encounters the terrifying apparition of a woman who pursues him and will attack if not avoided. Over the course of the game, it's revealed that Lisa was murdered by her spouse along with her two children whilst pregnant with a baby that may or may not have been her husband's. PT is a hugely unsettling game at the best of times, but the appearance of Lisa and her consequent stalking of the player character is downright haunting. As terrifying as she is though, we can't help but feel sorry for her. It's okay Lisa, come, come over here, I'm not gonna- OH MY JESUS CHRIST! Number 83. Tentacle Attack. Dead Space and the Dead Space Remake. More space for you now, and newsflash, they still can't hear you scream up there, but update on the situation with the neighbours, they now have a restraining order against us, so we have to move. Anyway, I digress. Both Dead Space and its 2023 remake take place aboard a mining spaceship that's been overrun by vicious monsters known as Necromorphs. Players jump into the space boots of Isaac Clarke, who must not only try to navigate his way off of a ship that's teeming with bloodthirsty monsties, but he must do so while battling the demons that reside inside his own mind. Dead Space is full to bursting with scary occurrences, but it was the first time that this tentacle attacks you that our community picked as the most pant-wettingly frightening. These gross fleshy limbs are encountered throughout the game and will generally catch players off guard as they shoot out from nowhere and grab hold of Isaac. His only hope of escaping is to shoot at the disgusting yellow bits, and if he's out of ammo, well, it's been nice knowing him, I guess. The initial jump scare is one thing, but the panic that sets in when you realise you're in control, this is not a cutscene and you need to get the darn thing to let go is enough to send blood shooting out of most players' ears. Number 82. Pamela's Zombie Dad, The Legend of Zelda, Majora's Mask. Our second entry for the utterly terrifying yet somehow still aimed at children The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask is players' encounter with Pamela's zombie father, which is just as unsettling as it sounds. Pamela and her father live together in the Music Box house, having moved there prior to the events of Majora's Mask in order to study the supernatural. And here, he conducts experiments on fairies, ghosts, and various other supernatural entities. However, sometime before Link visit, he's transformed into a Gibdo, a mummified, reanimated corpse. By playing the Song of Healing, Link is able to revert Pamela's father back to his original state, but sadly, there's no song in any known universe that can undo the emotional trauma brought on by feasting one's eyes upon his grotesque Gibdo form. When Link enters the music box house, he's greeted by jolly, upbeat music, and so as he heads downstairs and into the basement, players simply aren't prepared for the abject horror that's about to burst forth from a nearby closet. A sickly shade of green and partially wrapped in bandages with bulbous swollen lips and yellowed eyes, Pamela's zombie dad is the stuff of nightmares, and if this were literally any other game, he'd have gotten a swift shotgun blast straight to the face. Number 81. The Sorrow. Metal Gear Solid 3. Do you ever think about all the people you've murdered in video games? Do you ever wonder what would happen if you had to face them all again after they died? Well, fret not, because Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater has the answer, and it's absolutely horrendous. In Metal Gear Solid Canon, the Sorrow is a member of the Cobra unit, but unlike his comrades, he possessed no special combat abilities and instead was a gifted medium, and so could summon the dead and make use of their combat skills. Pretty neat trick, if you ask me. After his death, his ghost appears to protagonist Naked Snake on a number of occasions, though the most notable and unsettling of these encounters takes place in the spiritual realm. After jumping from a waterfall, Snake is 
force to wade down a seemingly endless river as the sorrow makes him face all of the spirits of those he killed during his mission in Selenoyarsk. The long walk through the river surrounded by the ghosts of those murdered by Snake is haunting, and will no doubt have stuck with players long after they finish the game. That is, of course, unless they didn't kill anyone, in which case the scene is just a bit anticlimactic, to be honest. Ashton? Number 80, Encountering an Alp, The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. CD Projekt Red's 2015 open-world RPG, The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, isn't a particularly scary game, but it does have its moments. After all, when you've got a bestiary that contains a buyer, wyverns and everything in between, there's bound to be the odd monster in there that's capable of giving players a nightmare or two. Our pick for this list, though, is the Alp, a ferocious vampire that players meet for the first time in the Blood and Wine expansion. Because, honestly, the initial encounter with one of these, uh, lovely ladies, is enough to spook even the most seasoned of witches. The Alp is an intelligent species of vampire, and is therefore inherently spooky on account of the fact they drink people's blood. In addition, however, they're supernaturally fast, have the ability to shapeshift, can shriek so loud that their adversary is incapacitated, and their saliva causes their victims to fall into a nightmare-filled sleep. So not only is death almost certain when attacked by an Alp, but it'll be preceded by horrifying dreams. Players' best chance of defeating an Alp is by using the Ard sign, coating their sword in vampire oil and drinking the Black Blood Potion, though that still won't guarantee victory. In our opinion, it's best to try and avoid altogether, if at all possible. Number 79, The Blindness Shard Trial, Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice. Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice is not a game that's scary in the same way that Outlast and Resident Evil are, but it still has the power to deeply disturb players nonetheless. The game follows the eponymous Senua, a picked warrior from Orkney who travels to Helheim in order to save the soul of her lover Dillian, who was sacrificed in a blood eagle by Norsemen. As though a trip to Helheim isn't terrifying enough on its own, Senua also suffers from psychosis, which she wrongly believes to be a curse, and is constantly plagued by voices in her head. On her quest to save Dillian's soul, Senua is forced to undertake a series of trials, and undoubtedly the most frightening of all of these is the Blindness Shard trial, which she is faced with roughly midway through the game. During the sequence, Senua is robbed of her sight, and players must guide her through the trial using only what they can hear and the limited vision of Senua's surroundings. The combination of blindness, the voice of Dillian in her head, and the near silence of her environment is incredibly distressful for Senua, and thanks to the masterful way in which the sequence is created by the devs, it's highly stressful for us players too. Number 78, The Spiders, Grounded. If you're not a fan of creatures with more eyes than legs and far too many appendages, then it's probably best to look away now. In Grounded, four young people, Max, Willow, Pete and Hoops, find themselves shrunk down to the size of insects, with no memory of how they ended up that way. And it's up to players to help them survive the desolate wilderness that is a suburban backyard. Unfortunately for any entomophobes out there, the kids aren't alone, and whilst on their quest to return themselves to normal size and figure out exactly how how this happened to them in the first place, they're confronted with some pretty creepy foes, including spiders, which are horrifying the first time you meet them and get no less frightening the more you encounter them. Even if you're not afraid of spiders, the ginormous eight-legged mini-beasts and grounded are still pretty scary, with their humongous pincers, spindly legs and red glowing eyes. Thankfully, grounded does come with an arachnophobia safe setting, which transforms the spiders into harmless looking blobs, but even with it cranked up to the max, they're still mighty disconcerting and no less powerful than their realistic looking counterparts. You're gonna need one ginormous glass to get rid of these skittery lads, let me tell you. Number 77, The Bear Trap, Until Dawn. Until Dawn is a fantastic little spooky title from Supermassive Games that takes players back to the good old days of campy slasher movies starring feckless teens. As daft as it is in places though, it still has the power to frighten players, offering up a number of spooky locales and jump scares galore. Whilst Mike, one of the less likeable of the unlikable band of teens, is exploring the abandoned hospital, he comes upon a rather strange sight, a severed hand poking out of a wooden box and waving at him. 
Now, if you're a horror aficionado, or are simply in possession of a bit of common sense, you'll have twigged that something is not right about this scene. If players choose to have Mike ignore the odd diorama, then nothing happens. Well, not beyond the rest of the spooky stuff in the game. If they engage with it, however, they are in for a bit of a shock, as grabbing the hands tags as of a jump scare in the form of a bear trap, and players are left with the choice of severing Mike's fingers or using the machete to prise open the trap, breaking the weapon in the process, which, naturally, has consequences further down the line. As we said, we expected something to be up, but we certainly weren't expecting the loss of a limb. Number 76, The First Liquor, Resident Evil 2 and Resident Evil 2 Remake. It turns out that, shockingly, survival horror title Resident Evil 2 has more than one scary moment in its runtime, as does its remake. And although we couldn't put all of them on this list, we simply couldn't decide between the emergence of Mr. X and the first liquor, so we've gone with both. If you're unfamiliar with the liquors, then firstly, bully for you, how nice it must be to sleep soundly at night. And secondly, allow me to paint you a horrifying picture. Liquors are a variety of bioorganic weapon that first made themselves known in Resident Evil 2 but are far more frightening than anything players have come across prior. Unlike the standard Resident Evil infected, liquors are blind, scurry about on all fours, and are devilishly quick, able to charge up to their quarry and pounce upon them from several metres away. Or yards, if you want to get imperial about this. Oh, and I also forgot to mention that they have a long barbed tongue that they can use like a whip, and claws that could bifurcate you with a single swipe. They can be avoided by staying quiet, but one wrong move and you'll discover a new meaning of the phrase tongue lashing. Suffice it to say that any Resident Evil 2 players suffering with constipation had no further trouble with the condition after meeting their first liquor. Number 75, returning to the Ishimura, Dead Space 2. Poor Isaac Clark, he just can't seem to catch a break, can he? He survives a spaceship overrun by necromorphs, and what's his reward? Mental illness and more necromorphs. Nightmare. Dead Space 2 is set some three years after the events of the first game, by which point Isaac is suffering from dementia and violent hallucinations brought about by the Markers. He begins the game in the asylum aboard the Sprawl space station, where he is semi-rescued before the necromorphs descend, and from there, he must fully escape his confines and try to survive the onslaught. However, in order to reach Tiedemann, the game's main antagonist, who initiates a project to build another marker so that he may harness its power, Isaac must revisit the Ishimura, the ship from the first game. The whole sequence aboard the Ishimura is seriously anxiety-inducing, as not only does Isaac have a variety of bloodthirsty creatures to deal with, but he must also come face to face with the horrors conjured up by his own mind. A dark, eerie, abandoned environment, grotesque, hostile monsters, terrifying hallucinations, it's like the devs took a look at the trolley full of horror tropes and proudly declared, we'll take the lot. The good news though, is that things don't get any worse for him from there. Oh, oh wait. Number 74, The Hospital, Brothers in Arms, Hell's Highway. War is, in and of itself, pretty scary, so we're not sure that Brothers in Arms, Hell's Highway needed to dial up the terror for players by throwing in a creepy abandoned hospital, but they did, and in doing so, the game has earned a spot on this list. Set during the latter part of World War II, the 2008 release follows Staff Sergeant Matt Baker, no, not that one, and his comrades as they prepare to undertake Operation Market Garden, which isn't nearly as pleasant as it sounds. Following a Luftwaffe bombing of the city of Eindhoven, Baker winds up going after one of his men, La Roche, who is trying to save a Dutch girl, pursuing him into a burning building. However, Baker becomes disoriented, jumps through a window into a river, and wakes up near an abandoned hospital. After eliminating the German patrols outside, Baker ventures into the facility in pursuit of La Roche, though what he actually winds up wandering into is a living nightmare. Not only the corridors of the hospital crawling with enemy soldiers, but they also look and sound like they've been lifted straight out of a survival horror game. There's no way in heck you'd catch me going in there. I'd take my chances with a court-martial. Number 73, The Anglerfish, Outer Wilds. When you go through a breakup, people will tell you that there are plenty of fish in the sea as a way to try and cheer you up. But it's best not to think too hard about that phrase, as one of the species that inhabit said sea is the anglerfish, which is honestly one of the most terrifying creatures I've ever laid my eyes upon. Thankfully, because it dwells hundreds if not thousands of metres below sea level, we landlubbers seldom have to face such scaly horror. That is, unless we're playing the outer wilds. The game sees players investigating the cause of a time loop, which causes the protagonist to keep going back 
back in time to 20 minutes before the solar system's star goes supernova. In order to figure out just what the heck is going on, the player must explore the solar system and collect clues, and while some areas are perfectly pleasant, others, like the Dark Bramble, are sheer nightmare fuel. While seeking the vessel, players must carefully navigate the Dark Bramble, being incredibly careful not to set off the giant anglerfish that dwell there. The fish are blind, so as long as you don't make any noise or bump into them, they will leave you alone. But that's easier said than done, as the level is incredibly claustrophobic and one wrong move could see the protagonist turned into fish food. If you were to look up the word tense in an illustrated dictionary, you'd probably find a still from this sequence. Number 72, Meeting the Flood, Halo Combat Evolved. Sometimes, it feels like if it can go wrong, it will go wrong. Take Halo Combat Evolved, for example. Not only did Master Chief and his chums have the Covenant, an unhinged collective of theocratic alien races to contend with, but they also wind up uncovering a second threat, the Parasitic Flood, whose only purpose in life is to infect and kill or consume all sentient beings they encounter. Talk about a bad day at the office. During the mission 343 Guilty Spark, Master Chief sets out to find Captain Keys, but he ends up finding far more pals than he bargained for. During his search, he comes across a somewhat harrowing scene, where he finds a dead body, several unoccupied bits of armour, and one heck of a lot of blood. Upon examining the helmet of Jenkins, no, not that one, he's able to get the full picture, and finds that the company was set upon by the Flood, who quickly overwhelmed and slaughtered the lot of them. No sooner has he finished watching back the recording of the massacre than the Flood decides descends upon him, and by this point, most players are probably thinking something along the lines of, if the Flood easily wiped out an entire squad, then what chance does Master Chief have? Of course, Master Chief overcomes the threat, because, you know, he's Master Chief, but that didn't stop our first encounter with the Flood from shaking us to our very cause. Number 71, Psycho Mantis Reads Your Mind, Metal Gear Solid. Our final Metal Gear entry is one that left us believing in the power of the mind, all whilst we cowered behind the sofa and begged our mums to set fire to our playstations because we thought that they were possessed. Prior to Snake's face off against Psycho Mantis in Metal Gear Solid, the villain attempts to demonstrate his psychic powers, first to Snake, then in terrifying fourth wall break, to the player. He starts out by reading Snake's mind, telling him he's a methodical man, the kind that kicks his tyres before driving, and one that's well suited to a stealth mission. Of course, that's not all that impressive to the player. After all, Psycho Mantis is part of the game, and it's just written to seem like he can read minds, right? wrong, because for his next trick, he's able to tell the player what games they've been enjoying prior to Metal Gear Solid, which he's definitely doing by reading the player's mind and not their memory card. Spooky stuff. But wait, there's more. Psycho Mantis can't just read your mind, he has telekinesis too, which he demonstrates by moving the player's controllers across the floor, with not more than his psychic powers. How he does it is painfully obvious nowadays, but to the youngsters of 1998, the experience was downright horrifying. Number 70. David Archer, Mass Effect 2. The story of Mass Effect 2's David Archer is as tragic as it is horrifying. The brother of Cerberus chief scientist Dr. Gavin Archer, David was born with autism and is a mathematical savant with unusually strong calculation abilities and an eidetic memory. Sadly, the Mass Effect universe is filled to the brim with people looking to exploit such capabilities and his own brother, desperate to see Cerberus's geth-controlling virtual intelligence project succeed, forcibly incorporated David into the VI program. When Shepard happens upon David, he is thoroughly shocked by what he sees. Stripped naked and suspended in machinery, eyes pinned open and tubes down his throat, David pleads for mercy. Although Gavin explains that he believes David's situation is for the greater good. good. Shepard is quite rightly appalled by the experiment, and players are given the choice of whether to leave David in the care of Cerberus, which may aid the war effort, or freeing David and taking him to an academy for gifted persons. If they choose the former, they'll find out in Mass Effect 3 that Gavin and eventually euthanized David after he became unresponsive, but by choosing the latter he gets a second chance at life, and when Shepard meets him at the Academy, he's doing well. Though freeing David does ultimately result in a happy ending for him, it still doesn't erase the horrific image of him strapped into the VI from our memories. Truly haunting. Number 69. Nice! Dolores Chapter. Visage. We've already talked about how disappointed we were, and still are, about the fact that Hideo Kojima and Konami's massive falling out meant that Silent Hills was cancelled, but although we never got to experience the full extent of Kojima's vision, we do at least have games like Visage, which are heavily inspired by P.T. 
silver linings and all that. Brought to life by various crowdfunding campaigns, Visage puts players in control of Dwayne Anderson as he explores a mysterious house and attempts to uncover the backstories of those who once lived there. Similar in setting and gameplay to PT, players are free to search much of the house as they please, though certain areas are locked and require keys in order to access them. The entire game is one long spook fest, but perhaps the scariest part is the section in which players uncover what happened to Dolores. To work out what the deal is with Dolores, players must first venture into the attic, and at first glance, everything looks pretty normal. There are lots of boxes, old bits of furniture, and a rocking chair that moves all by itself. Wait, I, hang on, what was that last one? From there, things get more and more unhinged, and what follows is a journey into madness that culminates in shocking discoveries about the woman's past. So, next time you're considering cleaning out your loft, maybe think back to your time with Dolores. Those boxes of junk aren't doing any harm up there anyway, just, you know, stay out. Number 68. The First Head Crab Encounter – Half-Life the Humble Head Crab. Despite its unassuming appearance, this little bulbous quadruped is capable of horrific violence, using its powerful legs to fling itself at unsuspecting prey before using its powerful beak to break into their skull in order to take over their mind, effectively turning them into a zombie. Sounds horrifying, doesn't it? Well, you know, that's because it is. As players make their way through Half-Life, they do get somewhat used to the constant threat of head crabs, but the first time they come across one, it's a fairly frightening sight to behold. After the explosion of the anti-mass spectrometer at the beginning of the game, Gordon Freeman begins making his way out of the Black Mesa research facility, but before he can actually escape, he must fight his way through a variety of enemies, including the aforementioned head crabs, which make their first appearance very early on in the game. They may be small and look a bit like a sad balloon taped to a prawn, but the head crabs are frighteningly fast, appear out of almost nowhere, and pack a mighty punch unless you're able to swiftly jam a crowbar into their central nervous systems. The vast majority of players were likely horrified the first time they encountered one, and those that weren't, well, we could only assume they'd already been attacked by head crabs and turned into fearless, unfeeling zombies. Number 67. I'm part of you now. Immortality. I don't think it's unfair to say that Immortality is a bit of a difficult game to talk about plot-wise without giving the whole thing away, so if you missed out on this 2022 interactive movie and intend to play it, I suggest you skip to the next entry and we won't spoil it for you. Immortality tasks players with piecing together what has happened to actress Marissa Marcel by viewing video clips and clicking on items or persons of interest to reveal more footage. This is not a simple case of a woman going missing, though, as it is revealed that two immortal beings, the one and the other, other have been taking over the bodies of various humans, with the one taking the form of Marissa. It's all a bit convoluted, but those who did manage to wrap their heads around it probably wish they hadn't, as grasping the situation makes the game's ending truly horrifying. By the end of the story, the one is in Marissa's body, whilst the other inhabits a pop star called Amy. In order to truly immortalise herself in film as the other did earlier in the narrative, the one asks the other to kill her on screen, and Amy films herself setting fire to Marissa. Following this, a grid of all of the clips collected through the game appears, then disappears to reveal the face of The One, who closes the game by simply saying, I'm part of you now, implying that the player is her new host. Chilling, if slightly confusing stuff. Number 66. The Thunderstorm. Gone Home. The 2013 walking simulator Gone Home tells the story of a young woman named Katie who returns to her family home to find it completely empty, leaving players to explore the house and piece together what has happened. It isn't the most action-packed game ever made, nor does it sit within the horror genre, but Katie's isolation as she tries to work out what's going on with her parents and younger sister Samantha sets the stage for some spooky moments. Katie arrives home in the midst of a thunderstorm, and whilst that in and of itself isn't all that terrifying, not unless you suffer from astrophobia, that is, the mysterious ab absence of her family and a strange note on the door from Samantha, coupled with the sound of rain hammering against the house and the occasional clap of thunder, is enough to chill anyone to their very core. Naturally, as the game progresses, the rain becomes somewhat like white noise, but the first thunderclap upon entering the house, especially with its eerie, abandoned atmosphere and flickering lights, left many players feeling uneasy at best and downright shaken at worst. It isn't the sort of jump scare that will leave you unable to sleep at night, but the next time there's a storm near you, it might just conjure up a little anxiety that you never had before. Number 65. The Rat King. The Last of Us Part 2. 
Despite being a pair of games that prominently feature zombies or not zombies, much of the horror in The Last of Us and its sequel comes from its human characters, though that doesn't mean that there aren't plenty of zomb scares to be had. Case in point, the Rat King from The Last of Us Part 2. Players encounter this um, handsome chap in the hospital in the Ground Zero chapter, and it seems very keen to make friends with Abby. While searching an ambulance, the Rat King makes itself known, and what follows is a tense chase sequence in which Abby must squeeze through uncooperative doors of the hospital and vault over gurneys. Running isn't enough, though, as ultimately she must face the horror head-on in a nail-biting boss battle that only gets worse as it goes on, since bits of the Rat King break away from its body, leaving Abby to face multiple smaller foes alongside the boss itself. Not only is the Rat King vile in appearance, being comprised of multiple clickers, stalkers, and a bloater to boot, but it's also wickedly fast, incredibly strong, and highly resilient, making it one of the most terrifying encounters in the entire franchise. Honestly, we'd rather take on a thousand golf club wielding abbeys than have to spend a second in the same room as this absolute monstrosity. Number 64 Giratina Jump Scare Pokemon Platinum we come now to an entry that proves that even the most family-friendly of video games have their frightening moments, and although Pokemon Platinum's Giratina jump scare isn't going to win any horror awards anytime soon, it's still a light spooking worthy of its place on this list. Like in Pokemon Diamond and Pearl, Pokemon Platinum sees a young Pokemon trainer venturing into the fictional region of Sinnoh, a place inspired by the real Japanese island of Hokkaido. It's not all catching cutesy critters and challenging gym leaders, though, as Team Galactic are up to no good and plan to use Pokemon in order to destroy the universe and create a new one all for themselves. Whilst their plans are pretty terrifying, it's the sudden appearance of legendary Pokemon Giratina that had fans of the game weeing themselves. Whilst Team Galactic head honcho Cyrus is delivering a monologue about his plans to use Dialga and Palkia to create a world without spirit, he's interrupted by Giratina, whose lunge directly at the camera caught most players off guard. It's a short and relatively innocuous fright, but it was entirely unexpected and came out of basically nowhere, and there's no doubt that it would have gotten gamers' hearts racing at least for a moment or two. Number 63. The Mannequins. Resident Evil Village. Shadows of Rose. When Resident Evil 7 was released in 2017, it was a certified spook fest, but although it was fantastic, it proved a little too scary for some players, and so for 2021's Resident Evil Village, Capcom dialed down the scare factor, though they didn't get rid of the frights entirely, nor did they shy away from them, for 2022 DLC Shadows of Rose. The additional content follows a now 16-year-old Rose Winters as she attempts to rid herself of her powers by entering the Mega My Seat. Once inside, she comes up against a variety of foes, all of which are rather horrible, but not one is a patch on the mannequins that she must quite literally face in House Beneviento. Whilst trying to find the fuse for the lift, Rose comes across a note that reads, Don't look away, and an ominous voice tells her, Don't let mommy catch you. In the next room is a mannequin with glowing eyes, which is rather disconcerting, but not all that scary. Only it turns out that the note was more than just the scribblings of an imaginative child and is actually life-saving advice, as once Rose looks away from the mannequin, it comes to life with murderous intent. Keeping an eye on one mannequin is far too easy, though, and as Rose progresses towards her escape, more and more begin to appear from all directions. Suddenly, window shopping doesn't seem like such a fun pastime anymore. Number 62. The Helgen Cave Spiders. The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. If you thought the spiders in Grounded were bad, just wait until you get a load of these guys. For the first few minutes of Skyrim's runtime, the Dragonborn, the game's protagonist, has a pretty rough time of it. First, they awaken in a meme that's taking them to their execution, then the whole affair is interrupted by a dragon attack, and finally they're forced to enter a cave system that's crawling, quite literally, with things that want to see them dead. The worst part of the whole ordeal, though, is undoubtedly the giant spiders that dwell within the Helgen Caves. Having escaped from Alduin and fought their way through countless Imperial soldiers, the Dragonborn is then forced to contend with a cave full of frostbite spiders, which are roughly the size of the cart that the player character rode into town on. They're not just big, though. These spindle-legged lads pack a serious punch, and it's quite easy for them to overwhelm the Dragonborn if they aren't dispatched in a timely manner. Suffice it to say that your next trip into your cellar will be a piece of cake after having dealt with these giant, scuttling boys and girls. Actually, on second thoughts, it's still terrifying down there. I'm not going in. Number 61. The Lecture Building. Bloodborne. 
For some, their time at school is great, but for others, it's a period of their lives they'd rather forget. But I think it's fair to say that not one of us faced the sort of horrors in our secondary school corridors that Bloodborne's protagonist, the Hunter, has to deal with in the lecture building. Like everywhere else in the game, the lecture building is dark, creepy, and crawling with eldritch horrors, but the near silence of the environment, the variety of enemies on offer, and one particular NPC come together to make the experience downright terrifying. Firstly, the setting itself is enough to give you the willies. Dimly lit halls, flickering candlelight, and little sound but the echo of your own footsteps all help to dial up the creepy factor. Then you've got the slime scholars to contend with, whose stretchy limbs make their attacks nigh on impossible to avoid, though it's their appearance more than their abilities that are the most frightening thing about them. I mean, just look at them! Finally, there's Patches the Spider, who may well be only an NPC rather than a threat to life and limb, but is still completely nightmare-inducing. As those spiders aren't bad enough, Enough. Why did the devs see fit to stick Agent 47's head on an arachnid's body? Awful. Number 60. Grandma in the Mirror. Prognostic. If you haven't heard of Step Hair Studios' 2022 indie horror title, Prognostic, then I can't really say I'm surprised, as it somewhat flew under the radar upon its release. Those of you who like your puzzles, however, and enjoy them with a spooky twist, will undoubtedly get a kick out of this murder mystery, so if that sounds like you, we highly recommend you check it out, but do watch out for Granny, though. Hang on, watch out for Granny, that can't be right, let me just ring the right to Hello, writer? Uh, yeah, it says on the prognostic entry, watch out for granny. That can't possibly be scary. What? Oh, oh god, okay, yeah, that, that does sound awful. It would seem that no mistakes have been made with this script, and the scariest thing about this game is in fact a little old woman. Alas, this OAP isn't going to bake you cookies and slip a tenner into your hand when your parents aren't looking. No, indeed, she's out for blood. And the only way to contain her is to keep those mirrors covered up. Fail to do so, and you're in for the jump scare of your life. Trust us, you won't be able to look in the mirror for a little while after you're done with prognostic. <laughs> Stop! Number 59. The Janitor. Little Nightmares. In a game titled Little Nightmares, you'd expect there to be a few frights, but I think it's probably fair to say that few players were prepared for the utter horror that is the janitor. No, not that one. Little Nightmares focuses on Six, a small raincoat-wearing girl who finds herself trapped in a place called the Moor. Little is known about the Moor beyond the fact that it's a floating iron vessel inhabited by a variety of monstrous beings. During the Lair chapter, Six must evade the clutches of the janitor, a horrific-looking humanoid creature with arms roughly twice as long as he is tall. Desperate to find something to eat, Six helps herself to some meat that she finds in an open cage, not knowing that this is part of a trap set by the janitor. She spends the rest of the chapter attempting to escape from the antagonist, who, despite being blind, is never very far behind her, and ever ready to grab hold of her with his creepy oversized limbs. The tense atmosphere of the level, coupled with the grisly appearance of the janitor, makes for one incredibly upsetting experience. And I don't know about you, but personally, my nightmares the evening that I played this particular game were pretty gosh darn large. Thank you very much. Number 58. The Ladder. Fear. We're sticking with games that do exactly what they say on the tin for the moment as we take a look at Fear, or First Encounter Assault Recon if you want to get less abbreviated about this, the 2005 FPS psychological horror that gave us all a good reason to be suspicious of children. Not to worry if you're not afraid of creepy children though, because Fear caters to all sorts of anxieties, and this particular moment is sure to shake up those who dislike kids and those with climacophobia alike. And yes, our writer has had a very nice time googling all of these proper names for phobias, thank you for asking. Fear centers on the titular US Army unit who head into a private military company's research facility after one of their psychic experiments has gone wrong. Once there, they discover that things are much worse than anyone feared, no pun intended, and they're faced with unpredictable, powerful psychic Alma Wade, who's not only lethal, but does everything she can to unnerve the place.
player. Whilst exploring the facility, protagonist Point Man is faced with a ladder. Looking around, all seems normal, and he begins to descend, but as soon as he does, Alma appears before his very eyes to deliver a jump scare. As though that's not bad enough, when players reach the bottom of the ladder, they get another jump scare in the form of one of Alma's hallucinations. Usually, two for the price of one is a great deal, but on this occasion, no, it's alright, you, you can keep it. Number 57. The Bottom of the Well, The Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time According to a number of beloved television shows, one of the biggest threats facing young people is wells, as the likelihood of getting trapped inside one is, apparently, astronomically high. However, if all young people have roughly the same amount of sense as The Legend of Zelda's Link and just go jumping into them with reckless abandon, we can see why it's such a problem. Don't jump into wells, kids, and not just because you might get stuck down there, but also because they might be as horrific as the bottom of the well in Ocarina of Time. The second that Link touches down, players know that something's up, as the game's music immediately becomes foreboding and spooky. He's then forced to crawl through a tiny vent and descend a ladder, before being faced with a giant spider with a human skull on its back. As though that's not disturbing enough, there are also massive winged skulls bathed in fluorescent green fire flying about the place, and this thing, which is truly haunting. Oh, and did we mention the room where the walls are lined floor to ceiling with more skulls, and the boss that looks like something HR Giga left on the cutting room floor for being too scary? Oh, sorry, that one must have slipped my mind. In summary, the entire level is just one big pile of nope. Number 56. The Fridge Control We heard you like Control, so we've got some more for you now, only this time we're looking at the base game rather than its DLC. Generally speaking, refrigerators aren't to be feared. In fact, if they're filled with tasty treats, then they can be really quite delightful. Sadly, what lies in the fridge in Control is far scarier than some off-milk and a bit of out-of-date ham. In the side mission, Fridge Duty, players find Agent Philip alone in a room, staring at a fridge that sits atop a pedestal. According to Philip, if someone doesn't watch the fridge at all times, it will deviate, and he himself has been watching it for two days with no breaks. Protagonist Jesse leaves to unlock the cell door, and when she returns, she finds Philip uh, alive and well and still staring at the fridge. Huh, okay, wasn't expecting that. Unfortunately, though, by the time she's able to enter the cell, Philip has broken eye contact, and all that's left of him is a puddle of blood. The manner of his death isn't confirmed, though based on the scene that's left behind, it was pretty brutal and probably incredibly painful. Great, now we can add kitchen appliances to the growing list of things I'm now afraid of, thanks to video games. Number 55. The Alley, Silent Hill We come now to the first of our Silent Hill entries, and this one comes to us all the way from the year 1999. The original Silent Hill tells the story of Harry Mason, a man who must search the eponymous spooky town in order to find his adoptive daughter Cheryl, who has gone missing. Whilst there, however, he stumbles upon a cult who are undertaking a ritual in an attempt to revive their deity, and he learns the truth about Cheryl's past. After awakening from a car crash at the beginning of the game and discovering Cheryl is gone, Harry sets off into Silent Hill to look for her. He spots a figure that he believes to be her and follows it, only to be led into a nightmare. The unseasonably bad weather should be the first tip-off that something's amiss with Silent Hill, but rather than turning back, Harry presses forward and finds further evidence that all is not well, culminating in the first transformation of the town as he heads down an alleyway. Then, after finding disfigured human remains and being attacked by strange creatures, Harry wakes up in a diner and everything is seemingly back to normal. It's the slow burn of the scenario here that makes it so utterly terrifying, as the situation gradually escalates from slightly odd to completely nightmarish, and there's no wonder it left so many gamers cowering behind their sofa cushions. Number 54. The Library, Metro 2033 
In the real world, libraries are wonderful places that offer people the opportunity to borrow books, surf the internet, and in some cases, attend classes or workshops. In the world of Metro 2033, however, libraries are probably best avoided. Based on the Dmitry Glukovsky novel of the same name, Metro 2033 takes place in a world ravaged by nuclear war. The player character is Archo, a survivor of the war who, along with many others, has taken refuge in the Metro Tunnel below Moscow, which face the threat of both humans and mutants, including the mysterious Dark Ones. In order to eradicate the Dark Ones, Artyom sets out to find the D6 missile silo, but to do so, he must figure out a way to get to it, and his best bet is to search the Moscow State Library for a map. Being shushed by an angry librarian is the least of his worries, though, and once in there, he and his men are set upon by mutants. Whilst his comrades bar the doors, Artyom heads deeper into the library, encountering strange tentacle-like creatures, jump-scare-loving mutated primates, and beasts that resemble gargoyles as he does so. Suffice it to say, he really should have just googled what he was after. Do support your local libraries though, kids. We can assure you that there aren't any mutants in those ones. Uh, I, I don't think. Number 53. The Falling Woman. Fatal Frame 2, Crimson Butterfly. I think we can all agree that falling isn't particularly fun. You could get hurt, damage something that you're carrying, or worst of all, people might laugh at you. Veteran horror fans might have been laughing at Fatal Frame 2's falling woman when she came flying across their screens, but many of us less seasoned spook lovers were too busy trying to get our blood pressure back to a sensible level to do any chuckling. Fatal Frame 2 Crimson Butterfly tells the story of twin sisters Mio and Mayu, who encounter paranormal activity whilst exploring an abandoned village. Things soon go south, though, as the spirits inhabiting the village begin to possess Mayu you and target the girls for sacrifice in an ancient ritual. While searching the Kiryu house, Mio comes face to face with perhaps the most terrifying sight in the game, a ghost known as the Falling Woman who makes her presence known by diving headfirst from the top of a clock tower. The moment comes and goes in a blink of an eye, but it's more than enough to thoroughly disturb the player, who might have been expecting something scary to happen, but almost certainly weren't betting on it being a quickly descending, shrieking woman. She probably landed on her feet though, right guys? There's definitely no need for us to go down there and check. Number 52. Dinner with Cannibals – The Walking Dead Season 1 If you're the sort of person that enjoys food and good company, then dinner parties can be a great way to get to know new people in your life or catch up with old friends. Generally speaking though, the menu at your average dinner party doesn't include human flesh, and it's for this reason that we'd highly recommend you come up with a good excuse not to attend any gathering hosted by The Walking Dead Season 1's St. John family. The bulk of the second episode of The Walking Dead Season 1 takes place on St. John's Dairy Farm, where Lee and his fellow survivors are welcomed by family matriarch Brenda and her sons Andrew and Danny. Sadly for the group, the family's good old southern hospitality hides a dark secret, one that Lee uncovers just in the nick of time. Lee begins to grow suspicious of the family after they're somewhat reluctant to reveal what lies behind a locked door in the barn. Further investigation on Lee's part reveals a slaughterhouse, though Andrew insists it's for animals. No less suspicious, Lee heads to dinner, but whilst having a quick look around upstairs under the pretense of going to wash up before the meal, he's horrified to find fellow survivor Mark missing his legs and warning Lee not to eat dinner. See, this is exactly why I often don't make new friends. One minute it's all, we'd love to have you for dinner sometime, and the next it's, we'd love to have you for dinner sometime. Number 51. Clanker – Banjo-Kazooie You might think that mascot platformers aimed at small children would be free from spooky moments, but you'd be wrong, as evidenced by 1998 N64 title Banjo-Kazooie. Now, to an adult player, Clanker of Banjo-Kazooie fame probably isn't going to be nightmare-inducing, but back when we were kiddos in the late 90s, this thing, despite being a friendly sort of chap, haunted our dreams for weeks. 
Found in Clanker's cavern, this semi-mechanical, semi-organic fellow is chained up and used by antagonist Grunty as a garbage disposal unit, which I'm sure we'll all agree is a pretty rough existence. It's just as well then that Banjo and Kazooie can rescue him from this fate. The reason though that so many youngsters were terrified by Clanker when they first came across him is his appearance. At first glance, he appears to simply be a mechanical shark-like creature with massive creepy eyes and a set of razor-sharp teeth. But look a little closer and you'll find that beneath his metal exterior, Clanker actually has fleshy bits, and as such, he's a sort of cyborg. Of course, he can't help how he looks, and his dilapidated state is no doubt thanks to Grunty, but regardless, when it comes to horrifying creatures in family-friendly games, they don't come much more terrifying than our pal Clanker. Number 50, Alien Invasion, The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. I'll be honest, I didn't go into this thinking the scariest franchise in all of gaming would be the Legend of Zelda series, but hey, here we are. For anyone wondering, no, this isn't the last Zelda entry we've got for you today. There's still one more to come later. One of the side quests in Majora's Mask sees Link attempting to protect Romani's ranch from alien invaders, and oh boy, or girl, or other, are those things absolutely terrifying. Descending upon the farm in the middle of the night, these eerie extraterrestrials are hellbent on stealing cows. During their assault, Link must fight them off using the hero's bow, and try to keep them away from the barn until dawn. Because should they break in, they'll abduct not only the cows, but Romany too. If the aliens' actions don't have you running for the hills, then their appearance surely will. Ghost-like with clawed hands and huge glowing eyes, these otherworldly beings look like the sort of things that would haunt Tim Burton's nightmares. Despite what the game tells us, I'm not sure that a bow and arrow would be enough to fend off these bovi-bothering intergalactic interlopers. Sorry Romany mate, you're on your own with this one. Number 49, The Dunwich Building, Fallout 3. Of all the bad things that could happen to the human race, and there must be, I don't know, four? Nuclear war has got to be one of the most terrifying. Even if you survive the initial blast, you've still got radiation sickness to look forward to, and if by some miracle that doesn't get you, then you've got to adapt to living in an irradiated post-apocalyptic hellscape. Thankfully, all of our leaders are nice and stable, so we here in the real world don't have to worry about that kind of stuff, not like those schmucks in the Fallout universe. To those without prior knowledge, the Dunwich building in Fallout 3 might not look all that imposing. The remains of what was once an office block stands somewhat unassumingly in the middle of a desolate landscape. Once you get inside, however, that's when the nightmare begins. Within the dark halls of the Dunwich building, players can find not only feral ghouls, but also a rather tragic fellow named Jamie. Driven mad by Ugg Colos Obelisk, Jamie resides in the building's virulent underchambers. Summoning ghouls out of the mists, his audio logs the only indication that he was ever human. Still, who are we to judge? He's just out here living his best post-apocalyptic life. Good for you, Jamie. Number 48, Shrugification, Quake 4. If you're unfamiliar with the Quake universe, then it's likely you've got no idea what the word strogification means. Well, you're one of the lucky ones. The term strogification is used in the world of Quake to refer to the process of turning an unwilling human participant into a strog soldier. According to the Quake 4 manual, the procedure is a horrific process, in which the limbs and flesh of the fallen are fused with metal and machinery to create the monstrosities that are known as the alien strog. Lovely. In Quake 4, players get to experience drugification from a first-person perspective, and let's just say that the anaesthetic isn't exactly forthcoming. Strapped into a chair on a conveyor belt, players are forced to look on in horror as protagonist Matthew Kane is scanned by lasers, stabbed and drilled in the chest, and given a pair of mechanical legs after his owner removed the buzzsaw, before finally having a neural implant jammed into his brain at high speed. The sequence is stomach-turning to behold, and most players probably thought that some kind of deus ex machina would show up at the last moment to save Kane from this horrific fate, but he has no such luck, and instead is forced to undergo one of the most terrifying medical procedures imaginable. And you thought having your appendix out was bad. Number 47, Stalked by Jack Baker, Resident Evil 7, Biohazard. After Resident Evil 6 somewhat pooped the bed in terms of its quality, things weren't looking great for the Resident Evil series, and fans were left to wonder if it could ever return to the glory days of the first few releases. Thankfully, all was not lost, and for the next mainline entry into the 
the series, Capcom really gave it their all, delivering the wonderfully frightening Resident Evil 7 Biohazard in 2017. The game throws players in at the deep end when it comes to the scares, and after protagonist Ethan Winters ventures all the way to Louisiana and is maimed by his wife, he finds himself doing his absolute darndest to avoid family patriarch Jack Baker as he tries to escape the Baker house. Following a rather tense dinner with Jack, Marguerite and Lucas, Ethan sets out to find the key to the front door. Sadly, his captors are none too pleased about this, and Jack begins searching the house to try and find Ethan. So as players explore, they'll have to be careful not to cross paths with Jack, or they'll be in for a very bad time. The house itself is creepy enough as is, but with the bloodthirsty Jack on your tail the entire time, it's a downright chilling place to be. Number 46, The Dollmaker, Alice Madness Returns. When he was writing one of his most popular works, Alice in Wonderland, all the way back in the 18 whenevers, Lewis Carroll probably never dreamed that one day his story would be adapted into an action adventure video game with horror elements. Admittedly, this is definitely more down to the fact that Lewis Carroll had no idea what a video game is than a lack of imagination on his part. But alas, here we are, and there Alice Madness Returns is. Ookie Kooky and Spooky in equal measure, Alice Madness Returns sees players catching up with the eponymous heroine a year after she's released from an asylum, to which she was committed following a fire that killed her entire family. Now under the care of Dr. Angus Bumby at an orphanage, she continues to experience hallucinations of Wonderland that lead her to some truly shocking discoveries, the most appalling of which being that Dr. Bumby, who manifests in Wonderland as the Dollmaker, was responsible for the fire. His horrific crimes are reflected in the Dollmaker's truly haunting appearance, which is sure to make even the toughest of players recoil in horror. We're not sure if it's the patchwork skin, the black goop emanating from his eyes and mouth, or his mismatched fingernails that are so upsetting. We need to get this guy to a manicurist stat. Number 45, The Monster at the Window, Alone in the Dark. Some might say the true horror of the Alone in the Dark franchise is just how badly it has declined in quality over the years. But alas, we can't include things that don't happen within the confines of a game's world on this list, so we've had to go with something else instead. Alone in the Dark is considered to be the grandfather of survival horror, to which the likes of the Resident Evil and Silent Hill series owe their very existence. And so naturally, the OG 1992 title has more than its fair share of spooky moments. Our pick, though, comes from the very beginning of the game. The story follows either Edward Carnby or Emily Hartwood, who go to the mansion of the recently deceased Jeremy Hartwood in order to recover a piano. As they approach the mansion, players will see a light that's on in the highest room, which isn't really out of the ordinary. Only when the camera cuts to the perspective of what's looking out from the window do players realise that something supernatural is afoot. The moment perfectly sets the scene for what's to come, and leaves players anxiously wondering when they'll be forced to face the monster that dwells in the attic. A simple but hugely effective scare if I've ever seen one. Number 44, Spotting Slenderman, Slender the Eight Pages. If you're not familiar with Slenderman, then I can only assume today is your first day on the internet. So allow me to welcome you. Try not to get into any arguments with strangers, trust me, it's not worth it. And if anyone sends you a link to a site called Lemon Party, for the love of God, don't open it. After doing the rounds for several years as an internet urban legend, Slenderman finally got his own video game in 2012, and it pretty much immediately went viral as content creators all around the world took to their PCs to shriek at a tall skinny man. It wasn't just content creators though, plenty of players were shrieking at the tall skinny man in the privacy of their own homes as well. The premise of Slender the Eight Pages is relatively simple. Players wander around the forest searching for the titular eight pages, and all the while they're stalked by the also titular Slenderman. The entire game is tense, atmospheric, and the first time you spot Slenderman watching you from a distance, you will poop yourself. I'm not going to lie, unless those eight pages include directions to a cache of buried treasure or irrefutable evidence of the existence of aliens and or God, I'm not completely sure they're worth the hassle. Number 43, The Mirror, Silent Hill 3. Our next Silent Hill entry comes courtesy of Silent Hill 3, which is admittedly not the best game in the series, but it's still a damn sight better than those pachinko machines that Konami keep peddling. No, I don't want to gamble, I just want Silent Hill. Is that too much to ask? 
In Silent Hill 3, players take on the role of Heather Mason, the adoptive daughter of Harry Mason, who you may remember from the first game in the series. A direct sequel to the original Silent Hill, the title sees Heather embroiled in the plans of the eponymous town's cult, who once again seek to revive the malevolent deity. Whilst exploring the totally normal and definitely not creepy hospital, Heather stumbles upon a room in which she finds a very large mirror. At first, things seem unremarkable. Well, as unremarkable as things ever are in Silent Hill. But quickly, the situation shifts and things in the mirror don't replicate what's actually happening. Streaks of what look like blood cover the floor and Heather in the mirror stops following the real Heather's movements and eventually the room mutates and kills our unlucky protagonist. Moral of the story, don't go poking around in hospital storerooms. You never know what horrors you might find. Number 42, Headless Genova, Final Fantasy VII. If you've played Final Fantasy VII, you'll know that antagonist Sephiroth is, for want of a better word, unhinged. Of all the batty things he gets up to throughout the game's runtime, however, nothing comes close in terms of craziness to his theft of Genova's head, which is not only a completely insane thing to do, but also left players with a truly chilling sight to behold. During the Nibelheim incident, which is pivotal to Final Fantasy VII's story, Sephiroth off, having descended into madness, lays waste to the village of Nibelheim and returns the reactor to collect his mother, Genova. However, being severely wounded, he's unable to take her entire body and instead elects to steal her head. When Cloud and the gang reach Hojo's lab, they happen upon Genova's remains, and the sight of her headless body haunts many players to this very day. The fact that she's been decapitated would be bad enough, but her body is also a strange shade of purple, covered in what looks like scars and legions, and she has a great big eyeball where her nipple should be. We're not really sure what exactly we were expecting to see when Cloud peeked inside Genova's chamber, but by golly, it certainly was not that. Could somebody get me some bleach? Yeah, I'm gonna put it in my eyes. Number 41, the man-bat jump scare, Batman Arkham Knight. Despite sounding like what you'd get if you ordered Bruce Wayne off of Wish, Man Bat is actually a pretty scary bloke. Or at least he certainly is for a second or two in Batman Arkham Knight. Taking place nine months after the death of the Joker at the end of Arkham City, Arkham Knight sees old Brutey Dubs going toe to toe with both Scarecrow and the titular Arkham Knight, the latter of whom plans to bring together all of Gotham's various criminals in order to put a stop to the Bat in Black once and for all. One of said criminals is the creatively named Man Bat, also known as Dr. Kirk Langstrom who is a scientist who went to extreme lengths to try and cure his own deafness, and now resembles the winged mammals you probably see fluttering around your garden on a warm summer's evening. Though not an especially fearsome foe when it actually comes down to it, Man Bat's first appearance gave players something of a shock to say the least. As Batman is doing what he does best and swooping around Miyagani Island, Man Bat is lying in wait, only to appear suddenly when Batman grapples onto a building. Sure, you might say that jump scares are cheap frights, but for a short time, they had us fearing Man Bat. You know, until we realised how rubbish of a villain he really is. Number 40. Mia's Memory, Psychonauts. Ah, oh, memories. Some of them are lovely, and recalling them makes you feel all warm and fuzzy inside. Some are less so, making us cringe at the thought, and then there are those that are utterly horrifying to remember. Mia's memory from 2005 Psychonauts falls into the latter category. Camilla Vadello, better known by her nickname Mia, is a famous Brazilian psychonaut known for her aptitude for levitation. A member of staff at Whispering Rock Psychic Summer Camp, she is a sweet, kind and caring lady, but behind her upbeat personality lies a tragic past. It's revealed that Mia was once a caretaker at an orphanage, but while she was out shopping for groceries one day, it caught fire and burned to the ground. Sadly, Mia was unable to help, and because of her telepathy, she was able to hear the screams of the children, none of whom survived. This memory is presented to players as a series of drawings, which show Mia reading to the kids, serving them food and singing with them, before the tone drastically shifts and we see the orphanage on fire and Mia's pained screams as she hears the children burning alive. The scenes aren't scary in that they'll have players hiding behind the sofa, but they are horrifying enough that they might just keep them awake at night, wondering if they turned the stove off when they were done with it. Hang on, did I turn the stove off when I was done with it? I'll be right back. Number 39. Boy of Silence Jump Scare – Bioshock Infinite Yes, the stove is off. For some, the scariest thing about Bioshock Infinite is just how convoluted its story is, but for most of us, it's definitely the moment when a Boy of Silence gets us with a terrifying jump scare, how dare you, that's very rude. The Boys of Silence are sentries that will sound an alarm if Booker gets too close or attempts to attack. Whilst their piercing shrieks only do a small amount of damage to the protagonist, they are able to summon minions to the current reality which will then attack Booker. Put simply, it's best to stay out of their way. Sometimes, though, that 
that's not possible, as is the case when Booker ventures up to the warden's office in Comstock House. In order to reach Elizabeth, who is trapped in the torture chamber, Booker must pull a lever in the warden's office to unlock a gate. Once the lever is pulled, all seems well. That is, until Booker turns away from the control panel and the player gets the fright of their lives in the form of a boy of silence who has appeared immediately behind Booker and begins screaming in his face, which in turn presumably led many players to scream at their screens. You might say that the boy of silence's sudden appearance came as something of a bio shock. Alternatively, you might not, and then punish the writer for writing that. Next entry, shall we? Number 38. The Dream Sequence. Fable 2. The Fable series isn't exactly famed for being scary. Well, unless you count the horror that is the many lies Peter Molyneux has told over the years, it's not on rails indeed. But as this entry from Fable 2 proves, the franchise isn't without its spooky moments. The level A Perfect World starts out rather pleasantly. The hero becomes a child once again and gets to spend a lovely day with their sister Rose, undertaking fun tasks like shooting bottles, killing beetles, and kicking chickens. Jesus, this kid's some sort of psychopath. Anyway, once you're done harming small animals for entertainment, Rose will tell the hero to go to bed. No sweet dreams for you though, I'm afraid, because our protagonist will awaken in the middle of the night to the sound of strange music. Rose will implore them not to follow it, but follow it they do regardless. The sound leads the hero through a previously unopened gate, which is where things take a turn for the spoopy. Rose will scream, blood will rain from the sky, and corpses impaled on flaming swords will litter the hero's path as they make their way towards the source of the music. Though the sequence is unsettling for the player, we can't help but feel that it's exactly what the hero deserved after their exploits during the day. This is what you get for booting poultry. Number 37. The Serial Killer. Red Dead Redemption 2. Our second and final entry from the Red Dead series comes once again courtesy of Red Dead Redemption 2, because it turns out that there are more than just coyotes and cannibals in them there hills. One of the stranger missions in RDR 2, that is a mission given to the player by a stranger and not one of the weird missions in the game, you understand, sees players tracking down a grisly murderer. First they must travel to each of the crime scenes, inspect the mutilated bodies and collect maps that will ultimately lead them to the sadistic killer. Each of the bodies is missing its head, which must be located in order to retrieve the maps, and at two of the locations, the psychopath has left creepy messages. Once in possession of all three maps, the player must work out where the killer is and then have protagonist Arthur head to his lair to confront the son of a gun and bring him to justice. He initially gets the jump on Arthur, knocking him out, and if players aren't able to subdue and hogtie the serial killer, he'll overpower Arthur and torture him to death. We're not sure which is worse, getting tortured and murdered by a bowtie-wearing, mustachioed psycho or dying of TB. I think I'd probably take my chances with the TB. TB honest. <laughs> Uh. Number 36. The First Reaper Leviathan. Subnautica. If, like our writer, the idea of deep sea exploration fills you with dread, then you're not going to much care for Subnautica, the 2018 action adventure title that sees the player character Riley donning his wetsuit and getting up close and personal with the local aquatic fauna. Well, local to the planet 4546B, anyway. Whilst there are plenty of friendly creatures in the waters of Subnautica, there are also lots of unfriendly ones as well, such as the cute but angry crab squid, the cold water dwelling ice worm, and the teleporting warper. Whilst all of these are fearsome foes, However, not one is a patch on the Reaper Leviathan, and the first time you clap eyes on one of those nightmare-inducing creatures, well, let's just say I hope you brought a change of wetsuit. These massive aggressors are over 55 metres long, or 180 feet if you want to get imperial about this, have massive mandibles that lock prey in place so that it can chow down, and are able to use their roars as sonar, meaning that if you can hear one, it can see you. To give you an idea of just how terrifying this creature is, the motivational note that comes with its databank entry reads, Congratulations! on getting close enough to scan it and living to see the results. I think I'll just stick to the rock pools from now on. Number 35. Moira Asylum. Thief. Although Thief isn't the best stealth video game ever made, it does have its enjoyable moments. It also has some incredibly spooky moments as well, such as the jaunt into Moira Asylum that protagonist Garrett takes partway through the game. Thief is set in a place known as The City, a dark, gritty Victorian and steampunk-inspired location that is plagued by a disease called the Gloom. After a job goes wrong, Garrett falls into a coma and awakens a year later to find many parts of the city in lockdown. He's contacted by an associate, Basso, to steal a ring from a Gloom victim's corpse, which leads him down something of a rabbit hole that sees him entangled in the supernatural. Whilst visiting the hideout of 
his partner Erin, Garrett has a vision that leads him to Moira Asylum, and if you thought that the plague-ridden city was bad, just wait until you get a load of its psychiatric facility. Situated on an island Alcatraz-style, Moira Asylum immediately gives players a sense of isolation, which is cemented by the layer of fog surrounding the place and the dozens of crows that call the island home. Once inside the asylum itself, things only get spookier, and players will find themselves on the edge of their seat as they await the next jump scare. Honestly, it's enough to drive you mad. Number 34. Don't move until dawn. Now, before anyone starts, yes, technically this entry covers several moments in Until Dawn, so I suppose you could say that it's something of a wild card, don't tell Peter, on a big list as well. But you didn't see that coming, did you? Please don't tell Peter. Until Dawn features a group of hapless teens who reunited a mountain cabin on the anniversary of their friend's disappearance, but almost as soon as they arrive, things start going south. The group begin fighting amongst themselves. The brother of the missing friends executes a truly unhinged revenge plan on the rest of his pals, and perhaps most worryingly, the party is stalked by bloodthirsty Wendigos. The game is filled with quick-time events and difficult choices, but perhaps the most blood-pressure-raising mechanic is the one that simply tells players, don't move. All players need to do during these segments is not move the controller. However, the motion sensors in the DualShock 4 are incredibly sensitive, and even the slightest tremor could spell bad consequences for the characters, up to and including incredibly violent deaths. Of course, it is possible to cheese these sections by simply setting the controller down on a surface like a coffee table, but that's not really in the spirit of the game now, is it? Number 33. The Baby. Resident Evil Village. Usually, babies aren't all that scary. Yeah, they're loud, helpless, and often quite smelly and sticky, but generally speaking, they don't have the power to frighten. Of course, the exception to this rule is the giant baby that players encounter in Resident Evil Village. No, not that one. The second act of the game sees players exploring House Beneviento, a mansion whose basement is somewhat like an escape room. After working out half of the puzzle, which leads them to the bottom of a well, players will find that protagonist Ethan Winters is being stalked by something, and that something resembles a huge malformed fetus. Covered in viscera and constantly wailing, this foul, misshapen creature will hunt Ethan down as he tries to find the fuse for the lift, and having been stripped of all of his gear, he has no means of defense against the thing. So if it catches hold of him, he'll be swallowed whole. The dark corridors of the Beneviento basement, coupled with Angie's haunting voice permeating throughout, are already spine-tingling enough without the threat of a humongous, disfigured baby to deal with as well. Ah, oh, whatever. It's just another excuse not to give that basement a good clear-out. <laughs> Sorry, dear. I'd love to declare out of the cellar this weekend, but there might be a fetus monster down there. You never can be too careful. Um, yeah. Okay, next time. Number 32. Deathclaw Sanctuary. Fallout 3. If you haven't played a Fallout game, then you may not be familiar with the humble Deathclaw, so allow me to clue you in. They're absolutely horrific. Mutant versions of the Jackson's Chameleon, the Deathclaws are one of the fastest and most powerful creatures in the whole game, sporting great big teeth, long sharp claws, and massive pointy horns on their head. But thankfully, they don't dwell in all that many places, so running into one is unlikely unless you've accidentally wandered into the Deathclaw Sanctuary, that is. Located between Dickerson Tabernacle Chapel and Broadcast Tower KB5, Deathclaw Sanctuary is home to more Deathclaws than you can shake a stick at, and if you do happen to have a stick for shaking, hold on to it, you can use it to smack those monsters. However, not only is Deathclaw Sanctuary crawling with beasts that would attack you as soon as look at you, it's also dark, misty, and there are lots of places for bloodthirsty creatures to lie and wait for some unsuspecting lone wanderer who would make a delightful afternoon snack. Yes, there are some decent rewards for exploring this creepy cavern, a mini nuke, a nuka cola quantum, and a skill book to name just a few, but we're not sure that the prize is worth the rise in blood pressure. A bottle of pop in return for a lifetime of nightmares. No oh, thanks. Number 31. Feeling lonely? The Seventh Guest. Although it might look somewhat primitive by today's standards, 1993's The Seventh Guest was once considered to be a killer app and boosted sales of PCs with CD-ROM drives thanks to its spooky atmosphere and unprecedented amount of pre-rendered 3D graphics. The once revolutionary game opened with a flashback to 1935, where a man named Henry Stauff kills a woman to rob her before having a vision of a beautiful doll and setting out to create it. He becomes a successful toy maker, building a mansion on the outskirts of town, but things take a turn when several children in possession of his toys fall ill and die, after which Stauff disappears into his mansion and is never seen again. Cut to the present day, when the game's narrator awakens in the house and begins having visions of past events, namely one night after the deaths of the children when six people were invited to the mansion, finding puzzles to solve upon their arrival. One of these puzzles is a maze in the dungeons, which is accompanied by one of the most unsettling voice lines in all of video gaming. Each time the player hits a dead end, a scare chord loudly sounds and a creepy voice will say, Feeling. 
As though the jump scare and the sudden appearance of a wall isn't bad enough by itself, you've then got to deal with some spooky git murmuring weird phrases at you. Nightmare. Number 30. The Descendants. Uncharted Drake's Fortune. The Uncharted series is chock full of thrilling and exhilarating moments, but it's not exactly known for scaring its audience. Sure, there are times when you fear for Nathan Drake's life and wonder just how the hell he's gonna get out of his latest scrape, but you're not likely to have nightmares about it. What you are likely to have nightmares about, however, are the Descendants, vicious humanoid creatures that Nathan encounters in the first Uncharted title. These freaky-looking dudes are the descendants, as the name would imply, of the Spanish colonists that took control of El Dorado from the Amazon rainforest. After the treasure turned them all into cannibals, Sir Francis Drake ensured they could never leave their colonized island by destroying their ships, and for over 300 years, they bred with one another and mutated. Nathan and Elena come face to face with these horrifying specimens whilst trying to find a way out of the treasure vault. They run into pirates, Eddie and Procoso, or more aptly, the pirates run into them, and Nate discovers that the two are fleeing from an unknown enemy that has slain the rest of their men. The enemy doesn't remain unknown for long, though, as one of the descendants crawls out of a pit and kills Procoso before being joined by its many, many friends. See, this is why we don't go poking about in old buildings looking for treasure. Number 29. The Blood Mazes – Max Payne Released in 2001, Max Payne centers on perhaps one of the most unfortunate protagonists in all of video gaming. The titular Max, a former NYPD detective, is dealing with the deaths of his wife and newborn daughter, both of whom were killed by drug addicts high on new designer substance, Valkyr, when he himself is framed for the murder of his friend Alex. Backstories don't come much more tragic than that. He should go on the X Factor. Simon Cowell would love him. Whilst on the hunt for the truth behind all of this bucket kicking, Max finds himself embroiled in a conspiracy involving an organized crime syndicate, a pharmaceutical company, the US government, and a secret society. Sounds like the beginning of a joke, doesn't it? Hey James, an organized crime syndicate, a pharmaceutical company, the US government, and a secret society walk into a bar. Anyway, where was I? Oh yeah, the harrowing bit. Whilst on the trail, Max winds up experiencing powerful hallucinations in which he's forced to navigate mazes of blood which are accompanied with the sounds of screaming, his wife sobbing, and his daughter crying. These sequences, while relatively short, are near traumatizing for the player, so we shudder to think how Max himself felt. Poor guy. At least he's got his new record deal with Simon Cowell, though. That's, that's something, I suppose. Number 28. The Finger Amputation. Heavy Rain. How far would you go to save the life of someone you love? If your answer isn't, I'd be willing to risk life and or limb, then you're far less brave than sad dad Ethan Mars from 2010's Heavy Rain. And hey, I'm not judging, I don't think I could cope with what he went through either. The game follows Ethan, a man whose family has fallen apart following the death of one of his sons, as he desperately attempts to locate his other child, Sean, sorry, I mean Sean, who has been kidnapped by the dastardly origami killer. The serial murderer's MO sees him nabbing children and then putting their fathers through a series of trials which range from somewhat painful to downright deadly. One of Ethan's trials seems quite straightforward at first. He must take an implement of his own choosing and cut off the tip of one of his own fingers. Painful, yes, but probably something most of us could do to save the life of a loved one if we really had to. When it comes down to it, though, the amputation is a harrowing experience, and we, the audience, are put through a highly tense sequence in which Ethan reasons with himself and attempts to choose the least bad method of removing his fingertip. Spoiler alert, none of them are particularly good options, and Ethan's screams of pain will haunt players for a good while after they've put down the game. Number 27. The Collector Ship, Mass Effect 2 
We're back in space now to join Commander Shepard and friends as they go for a wander around an abandoned collector ship. I wonder what delights will be in store. In Mass Effect 2, following the Horizon mission and after meeting squad number requirements, players will be called to the comms room on the Normandy, where Joker will tell them about a collector ship disabled by Turians that the crew can patch ED into in order to gain more information about what the collectors are up to. Sounds straightforward, right? <laughs> Wrong. It's a ship of nightmares. The second Shepard and his band of merry adventurers are aboard, things take a turn for the eerie. They find a pod, like those on Horizon, only empty and piles of dead bodies, which I probably don't need to tell you is not a good thing. Pressing on, they discover that, plot twist, the collectors are genetically modified Protheans, and they've been experimenting on humans in order to test and compare their DNA with their own. Heading further into the ship, Shepard and co will discover a chamber filled with more pods than could possibly be filled with all of the humans in the galaxy, which is disconcerting to say the least. Still, at least Shep and the gang can deal with all of this horror without swarms of enemies descending upon them, right? <laughs> right, right guys? Number 26, Ravenholm, Half-Life 2. More location-based terror now, and although this one is of the earthly variety, it's still full to bursting with aliens of the less-than-friendly variety. Once upon a time, Half-Life 2 locale Ravenholm was a lovely little mining town presumably filled with lovely little people going about their lovely little day-to-day -day lives. However, after the Combine invaded Earth and conquered the place in just seven hours, it turned into a refugee camp for those who escaped City 17 in a bid to join the Resistance. Sadly, by the time bespectacled hunk Gordon Freeman finds his way to the town, things are less viva la resistance and more someone get me my brown pants. You see, although Ravenholm managed to stay off the Combine's radar for a while, ultimately it was discovered and the invaders were none too pleased. They bombarded the settlement with headcrab shells and its inhabitants were slaughtered and turned into mindless zombies. With no other choice, the survivors fled, abandoning Ravenholm. Unfortunately, when Black Mesa East is raided, Gordon is forced to escape through Ravenholm. Dark, creepy, littered with dead bodies and infested with headcrabs and their human hosts, Ravenholm is one of the most terrifying locations in all of video gaming. Thankfully, its one remaining inhabitant, Father Grigori, is not only on Gordon's side, but is also incredibly resourceful. He may be a little unhinged, but without him, I don't think we could have summoned the courage to make it through Ravenholm. God bless you, Father Grigori. Number 25, the T-Rex, Tomb Raider. The Tyrannosaurus was a species of dinosaur that roamed the Earth during the Upper Cretaceous period, roughly 66 to 68 million years ago. These gigantic predators grew to around 40 feet in length and 12 feet in height, that's roughly 10 tiny peters long and three tiny peters tall, and could weigh as much as 15,000 pounds for about 30,000 Billy Ray walruses. They also had four in long claws and razor-sharp teeth that could be anything up to a foot in length, meaning they could make short work of their prey. There's no wonder then that the T-Rex has such a fearsome reputation, and even tens of millions of years after they've gone extinct, are able to stir up terror in human beings. Case in point, the sudden appearance of one in the original Tomb Raider. Whilst Lara is exploring the Lost Valley, she finds herself facing a number of smaller dinosaurs, which is pretty bizarre, but not too worrying. After all, a couple of bullets seem to do the trick when it comes to getting rid of them. However, when she presses on, she soon comes face to face with a much larger lizard that comes stomping into frame out of the low draw distance darkness with barely any warning. Granted, players probably knew something was up when the foreboding music suddenly kicked in, but they probably didn't expect to find themselves staring into the gaping maw of an unnervingly low-poly, angry T-Rex. <laughs> nice dinosaur, please donate me! Number 24, The Ghost Girl, Pokemon X, Y, Alpha Sapphire, and Omega Ruby. Right, we've had plenty of hefty spooks recently, time now for something a little lighter, a diet spooking 
if you will. In Pokemon X, Y, Alpha Sapphire, and Omega Ruby, players can be visited by the ghost of a girl. Upon entering a building in Lumio City and heading to the second floor, the girl will appear behind the player character in front of the lift doors before gliding in front of them and saying, no, you're not the one, and then heading off on her merry way. She can be found again later in the game, but if the player character tries to approach her, she'll tell them to go away as she's listening for the elevator. Weird. The game provides absolutely no context for these creepy encounters, and the girl never shows up again after the second meeting, which has led players to wonder exactly who she is, why she appears, and if they're not the one, then who is? Naturally, internet sleuths have been on the case for years, though to date, nothing concrete has ever been uncovered. Some think that The One is a player with a specific trainer ID, whilst others believe that the girl may be the key to unlocking some sort of rare ghost-type Pokemon. Though neither of these theories seem to hold much water, one thing is for certain, that ghost girl is one creepy little miss. Number 23. The Finger Paint Killer – Watchdogs Sometimes, life deals you a rough hand. You can either try to make the best of things, as most people dealing with adversity do, or you can become an unhinged serial killer like Edgar Noon in the 2014 action-adventure title Watch Dogs. We can't say we recommend the latter course of action, though. One of the investigations that bland protagonist Aidan Pierce can embark upon during Watch Dogs runtime is the missing persons case, which sees the beige hero looking into a series of disappearances of six women from the Chicago area. These disappearances are soon attributed to a serial killer as bodies begin turning up all over the city, each accompanied by a somewhat sickening image drawn in blood, hence finger paint killer. Aiden is able to track down the murderer, a man by the name of Edgar Noon, who has been targeting haemophiliac women in order to, quote, end the bloodline. To clarify, Edgar himself suffers from haemophilia, a blood clotting disorder, and believes it to be the reason he feels the need to sin, and by killing people with the issue, he hopes to go to heaven. This one's got everything. A series of chilling crime scenes, an insane criminal who believes what he's doing is for the greater good, the greater good. Shut it! and a protagonist capable of boring you to death. <laughs> You'll sleep well tonight, won't you? Number 22. Nemesis Bursts Through a Window – Resident Evil 3 Yes, it's another Resident Evil entry. Who'd have thought one of the biggest names in horror gaming would have so many scary moments throughout its long history? Not me, that's for sure. Maybe we should make a list about it. Oh, okay, never mind. The seventh Resi entry on this list comes courtesy of the series' third title, 1999's Resident Evil 3, which is set alongside the events of Resident Evil 2 but focuses on a different set of characters. When protagonist Jill Valentine finds herself trapped in Raccoon City just as all hell breaks loose, she needs to find a way to get the heck out of Dodge, and sooner rather than later. Sadly, her efforts to escape are somewhat hampered by hulking bioweapon Nemesis, who's been dispatched to take Jill out as she knows too much. Massive, murderous, and unable to be killed with standard weapons, this mighty lad is quite the terrifying adversary, and it doesn't help that he seems to pop up at the most inopportune moments, the scariest of these being his impression of the Kool-Aid man that he does while Jill is in the Raccoon City police station. His appearance really comes out of nowhere, and so there's little wonder it caught gamers by surprise the first time they played the game. God, I really hope there's a safe room nearby. I need to compose myself. Slash change my pants. Number 21. The Spider Chase. Limbo. Oh yay! More spiders, how wonderful. 2010's Limbo, developed by indie studio Playdead, which incidentally is exactly what I'd probably do if I came across a ginormous arachnid, tells a somewhat ambiguous story of a young boy who's searching for his sister. Whether the game really is a simple tale of a child looking for his missing sibling, or a complex allegory for death, grief, and the existence of an afterlife is unclear. But one thing that is for certain is that it's a chilling experience for all who play it. Perhaps the most frightening moment in Limbo, though, comes within the first ten minutes of its runtime. After the boy sails across a river and enters the forest, he finds a number of disconcerting things 
tracks, including a series of bear traps and what looks like the remains of an animal strung up from a tree. It's only when he presses deeper into the woods that these things start to make sense, as a humongous spider creeps out from the edge of frame. The game up to that point is already rather unsettling, what with its oppressive, lonely atmosphere and its stark audiovisual presentation, but the appearance of the spider is enough to send most players over the edge. Thankfully, we Brits are unlikely to find any creepy crawlies that big in our garden sheds. But legally speaking, Triple Jump cannot make the same guarantee for any Australian viewers. Ugh. Ashton. Number 20. The Cannery. Resistance Fall of Man. Set in an alternate version of history, Resistance Fall of Man tells the story of an alien invasion that takes place throughout the 1940s, leaving much of Europe in the control of a force known as the Chimera. By 1949, the hostile forces are tunnelled under the English Channel and conquered much of Britain, leaving only scattered clusters of human resistance. These aliens aren't content with just busting in and taking over, no sir. Like the anti-King Louis, they want us all to be like them, and have set about infecting any human they find and subjecting them to artificial evolution. Not cool, guys. Enter the USA to sort things out, and all of their men except one are immediately killed. Brilliant. Not to worry, because Sergeant Nathan Hale is still on the case, though things don't exactly go well for him. After his squad is ambushed, he's taken to a Chimera conversion center in Grimsby, the horror, and must fight his way out of the facility. The scene before Hale as he wakes up is truly nightmarish, and we, the audience, are forced to watch on as a human is loaded into a machine to be molded to the Chimera's sick, twisted specifications. Not sure which is worse, forced human experimentation or Grimsby. Probably the latter, to be honest. Number 19, The Dentist Jump Scare, Bioshock. As previously discussed, the depths of the ocean are utterly terrifying. You know, with the ridiculously high pressure that could crush you in milliseconds if your equipment fails, and all of the horrendous beasties that call the oppressive environment home. Apparently though, the developers of Bioshock just didn't think that the deepest part of the ocean was scary enough, and decided that what the Atlantic Ocean really needed was an underwater city filled with psychopaths and murderous lunatics. Not all of said psychopaths and murderous lunatics come running at protagonist Jack, flailing and screaming though, and some prefer to sneak up on him, giving players the fright of their lives. One such creepy lad can be found in the dental area of the medical pavilion, lying in wait to give Jack an unwelcome surprise. As our hero explores painless dental, he finds a desk on which stands the speedy hacker tonic, some bandages, and an audio diary. After picking up the tonic, however, the screen is shrouded in mist, and when players turn Jack around, there's a splicer right in his face. The Splicer can be dispatched with a swift wrench to the face, but his sudden appearance comes as something of a shock to players. A bio shock, if you will. What? What do you mean we've already done the joke earlier? Ah, <sighs> just move on, shall we? Number 18, Flowey Knows What You Did, Undertale. When it was released in 2015, Undertale was something of a surprise to gamers, as it was a surprisingly good RPG that frequently succeeded in making its players feel really, really bad. One moment that not only has players feeling rotten, but also has the power to chill them to their very core, comes courtesy of antagonist Flowey, and the fact that he knows far too much. If, like many players, you attempted a pacifist run, but accidentally killed Toriel during her boss fight, it's likely that you felt guilty for doing so and reloaded your save. Unlike other games, Games, however, Undertale does not forget your past transgressions, and when you start up the title again, you'll be greeted by Flowey, who has a rather sinister message for you. First, he congratulates you on your cleverness, before revealing that he knows exactly what you did. You murdered Toriel and then tried to cover it up because you felt guilty. The reveal is a real rug pull for players, and tells them that even if they try to undo their actions, the game is watching. Ultimately, you might end up sparing everyone, but if at any point you do head down a violent path, there's going to be no hiding it from the ever-watching Flowey. He's probably even got his eyes on you right now. What's that, Flowey? Tell the viewer to stop picking their nose? See what I mean? Number 17. Shinra Manor, Final Fantasy VII 
Sometimes all it takes to transform a sequence from banal to terrifying is a little bit of spooky music, as proven by the Shinra Manor portion of Final Fantasy VII. Located on the outskirts of Nibelheim, Shinra Manor is an abandoned mansion once used by Shinra Electric Power Company as a study for their researchers. It's also famed for its role in the Nibelheim incident, as this is where Masune wielding Tosspot Sephiroth discovers the truth of his origins and decides that the whole planet can go to heck. When Cloud and the gang, not to be confused with Cool and the gang, return to Nibelheim, they have the chance to enter Shinra Manor, and though players have the option not to do this, opting to stay away will rob them not only of a chance to get Vincent in their party, but also the opportunity to treat yourself to a light spooking. The mansion's interior is incredibly dilapidated and run down, and has lots of enemies for Cloud and pals to fight. Aesthetically, it's plenty creepy, but it's the soundtrack that kicks things up from spooky to nightmarish. Chilling players to their very cause with the clever utilisation of loud bongs. That is, the noise a bell makes, not the other kind. It's not a place you want to spend the night alone, put it that way. Number 16. Trying to survive without BB. Death Stranding. Although the gaming world was devastated when Silent Hills was cancelled, there was some comfort in knowing that Hideo Kojima, Guillermo del Toro, and Norman Reedus would still be working together on Death Stranding. Then the game came out, and many players went back to being disappointed, but that's by the by. Still, although the game was described by one journalist as the most advanced walking simulator the world has ever seen, it isn't without its merits. The graphics are solid, the voice acting is top notch, and it has some very interesting ideas and unique concepts. Concepts. Plus, it has the power to give anyone the willies. One of the biggest threats to protagonist Sam, and indeed everyone in the United Cities of America, are BTs, invisible creatures from the breach that will explode nuclear bomb style if they consume a living human being. Luckily, they're nice and easy to detect if you've got a bridge baby, aka a BB, with you. Sadly, in Chapter 6, Sam is separated from his BB, so trying to get around goes from being relatively straightforward to a complete nightmare. Because the BTs are invisible, it's near impossible for Sam to locate them until he's pretty much on top of them, and their sudden appearance is incredibly frightening if you're not prepared for it. On second thoughts, it's actually pretty frightening even if you are prepared for it. Maybe it's best just to stay indoors. Number 15. The Basement Visage We've already talked about how the tippy top of the house in Visage is truly haunting, and would you believe it, it turns out that the basement is no better. Honestly, I'm shocked. Are you shocked? I'm definitely shocked. The basement is first explored during the game's initial chapter, in which we learn all about Lucy, a young girl who was befriended by a demon in 1965. Because of the demon's influence, Lucy's behaviour became more and more erratic, and after she brutally murdered her pet bird whom she really loved, her parents sent her to therapy. Unfortunately, therapy in the 60s wasn't what it is nowadays, and if anything, it made Lucy's mental state even worse. Ultimately, the girl locked herself in the bathroom and, at the behest of the demon, ripped off her own jaw, dying of blood loss as the door was locked and her poor parents couldn't reach her in time. If Lucy's story isn't enough to keep you awake at night, then her appearance in the basement surely will be. Wandering the cellar, players will be on the edge of their seats, waiting for something to happen. But no matter how mentally prepared you thought you were, they were absolutely not ready for the horrific sight of a jawless girl shambling towards them. Yet another reason I won't be clearing out my cellar this weekend. Number 14. The Market of Redead The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time You'll probably be pleased to hear that this is the final Legend of Zelda entry on this list, though it's arguable that we've left the most horrifying moment for last. After Ganondorf claims the Triforce in Ocarina of Time, Link awakens seven years later and meets Raru in the Sacred Realm, who explains that Link's spirit was sealed away until he was old enough to wield the Master Sword, before sending him back to the Temple of Time. He then encounters the mysterious Sheik, who tells him to free fire temples from Ganondorf's control in order to awaken the sages that can imprison him in the sacred realm. So far, so not all that scary. It's only when Link leaves the Temple of Time that things take a turn, and players are immediately alerted to the fact that something is wrong, as the once beautiful colourful temple grounds are now all brown and murky, and an ominous ring of light circles a nearby mountain. When he reaches the market though, things really go south, and he immediately runs into a whole bunch of re-dead. This would be scary enough on its own, but couple it with a now bleak environment and the echoing screams that play over the scene, and you've got yourself a recipe for a spooking that you probably weren't expecting. Number 13. The First Ghost Battle – Fatal Frame 
from zombies to ghosts now as we take a look at 2001 survival horror Fatal Frame, or Project Zero if you want to get alternate sighted about this. Set way back in 1986, the year James Jenkins turned 34, Fatal Frame tells the story of siblings Miku and Mafuyu, the latter of whom goes missing while searching for a famous novelist in a haunted mansion. Pro tip, if you're looking for someone and your search takes you to a haunted mansion, maybe just send an email or something. Miss me with that haunted house crap. Naturally, it's left to Miku to track down her brother and sadly, the ghosts she winds up dealing with aren't of the Casper variety. Before we jump into Miku's shoes, however, we first get to play as Mafuyu, and it's his first encounter with a hostile spectre that makes our list today. Armed with nothing but a unique camera that can capture ghosts, Mafuyu explores the mansion, and it's not long before he's locked into a frightening battle with one of the malevolent spirits. First, players get a classic jump scare, as the ghost gets right up in Mafuyu's grill. Then, they're treated, if you can call it that, to a horribly tense battle in which they must shoot the ghost with the camera at the right moment in order to inflict enough damage. Yeah, I think I just call Ghostbusters. They are the professionals after all, and I certainly am afraid of those ghosts. Number 12, Monica Knows Your Name, Doki Doki Literature Club. To the uninitiated, Doki Doki Literature Club seems just like another dating sim, but those that have experienced it know it couldn't be further from the truth. Certainly, it starts out that way, but before long, things start taking a turn for the strange. If you haven't played this game, but you intend to, I highly recommend skipping this entry so as not to spoil things for yourself. Did they skip ahead? Okay, good. I'll continue. The game starts out fairly normally, but slowly gets darker and darker, eventually fully committing to the psychological horror bit. We first get an inkling that all may not be as it seems when Sayori, the protagonist's best friend, confides in him that she has depression and begins writing uncharacteristically morbid poetry. Realising something is wrong, the protagonist goes to her home to find that she has hanged herself and the game ends. Only, it doesn't. And upon restarting the game, players will find that the narrative repeats only with Sayori missing. Things get stranger and stranger, and eventually it's revealed that Monica, one of the other members of the eponymous literature club, has become self-aware and has been manipulating the game's codes to make the other girls seem like less viable romance options. What's most terrifying, though, is that she knows your name, not you as in the protagonist, you as in the player. Right, if anyone needs me, I'll be setting all of my electronic devices on fire. Number 11, The Dog, Resident Evil. Is this the final Resident Evil entry on this list? I guess you just have to stick around and find out. Spoiler alert, no it's not. Within a few minutes of the original Resident Evil's runtime, players become aware that the Stars team are not alone in the Spencer Mansion. Though the first time they played, they probably thought the humanoid zombies were the only threat. But oh how wrong they were, because a terrifying jump scare soon reveals that all manner of creatures have been mutated by the T-Virus. Whilst exploring the halls of the mansion, players are quickly acquainted with a mutated dog when it comes bursting through one of the windows on the ground floor of the East Wing without any warning, giving them a mighty fright in the process. Those having a go at the remake probably remembered the jump scare and were likely to be somewhat tentative when they were exploring the corridor, only to find that nothing happened. Huh, you perhaps thought to yourself, maybe they didn't include the dog this time around. Oh well, I guess I'll go about my business. Oh my god, it's right there. Indeed, Capcom, sneaky gits that they are, delayed the jump scare in the remake to keep things things nice and spicy for those that have played the original. We're not sure if we're mad they got us again, or impressed at their genius. Definitely a bit of both, I think. Number 10. The Groom, Outlast Whistleblower. Eddie Gluskin. It's not a name that strikes fear into the heart, is it? Well, just as a rose by any other name would smell just as sweet, Eddie Gluskin by any other name would still be as much of a psychopath. It just so happens, however, that he does have another name. The Groom. Yeah, still not all that scary. Thankfully, actions speak louder than words, and this is one fellow you wouldn't want to see waiting for you at the end of the aisle. Players first meet this... Uh, dashing gent in the Whistleblower DLC for 2013's Outlast where he can be found looking for his ideal bride. Alas, you won't find Eddie Gluskin on Bumble, Hinge or Plenty of Fish as this unlucky and love lad plans to create himself a bride, though his methods are less Dr. Frankenstein and more Dr. Yankin out your spine, or rather slightly more delicate parts. Sadly, Dr. Yankin off your penis didn't work for the joke. Unfortunately, protagonist Waylon Park gets a front row seat to this utter plops show as he is gassed by the 
the groom and awakens nude and strapped to a table with a buzzsaw between his legs. Luckily, another inmate of the asylum interrupts this rather unconventional date, and Waylon is afforded the opportunity to escape. Still, it's a tense few moments prior to this where players are left to worry if little Waylon will get the chop. Ugh, oh, crossing my legs just thinking about it. Shall we move on? Number 9. The Piano, Super Mario 64. Usually, the only scary thing that happens when I'm near a piano is my god-awful rendition of Chopsticks or When the Saints Go Marching In, though that's more in an alarmingly cringe sort of way than anything else. I am practicing, though. When you're in the world of Super Mario, however, tickling those ivories might just get you the fright of your life. Alright, oh, that's stretching things a bit. It's a light spooking at best, but to the young kiddos playing Super Mario 64 back in the day, that piano was a nightmare-inducing menace. To a small child, Big Boo's haunt might be unnerving enough in and of itself, and although the creepy mansion wouldn't be particularly anxiety-inducing for us adults, if you're only three or four years old, it might give you a tiny fright. What will give all of us grown-ups a good old-fashioned scare, though, is the piano that can be found in Big Boo's haunt. The first time that Mario passes the antique organ, and yes, we know that they are two different things, but there aren't that many synonyms for piano, nothing happens. Just a regular classical instrument, right? Wrong, because when he gets too close later on in the level, the piano opens up to reveal a set of huge, sharp teeth and chases Mario around the room. See? This is why you should never trust orchestral instruments. You'd never catch a synthesizer doing this, to you? Number 8. The Baby in the Sink. P.T. We've got another malformed fetus creature for you now, and whilst this one isn't giant, nor does it attempt to eat people, it's rather disquieting nonetheless. When Norman Reedus isn't hanging out with his bridge baby and doing his best to avoid BTs, he can be found skulking around ever-looping corridors, desperately looking for a way out. Unfortunately for him, he's not alone in there, and whilst Lisa probably wins the award for being the most outright terrifying inhabitant of the PT house, the disfigured baby in the sink has her beaten when it comes to repulsiveness. After wandering a few loops and coming face to face with the lovely Lisa, the unnamed protagonist of P.T. finds himself trapped in a somewhat dingy bathroom. Not to worry though, because he's got a new pal in there, a hideous viscera-covered sink baby. Excellent. It gets worse though, because later on in the playable teaser, the baby can be heard speaking in the same voice that can be heard coming from the radio. But why is there a freaky baby in the sink? Well, it would seem that it's a representation of the baby that Lisa lost when she was shot in the stomach by her husband, which makes it equal parts tragic and horrifying. Honestly, I'm not sure whether to call an exorcist or child line at this point. Peter? Number 7. Lavender Town. Pokemon Red, Blue and Yellow. When our pets get old or unwell, they all go to a lovely farm to live for eternity with all of the other animals who are on that same farm. It must be massive. When Pokemon get old or unwell, however, they wind up going to Lavender Town, the spookiest region of Kanto, the setting for Pokemon Red, Blue, and Yellow. Lavender Town is home to Pokemon Tower, a graveyard filled with the tombs of countless deceased Pokemon and their grieving trainers, as well as a whole bunch of ghost types and the spirit of a Marowak who searches for her orphaned Cubone. Oh man. Well, there goes my smile. The town is a massive departure in terms of tone from that of the rest of the game. It also forces the players to confront the idea that Pokemon don't, in fact, live forever, or go to a farm like our pets, but can and do die. Lovely. Now I have to face the fact that my beloved Charmander is one day going to bite the dust. Thanks for that, game. Oh, and if all that isn't spooky enough for you, there was an urban legend floating around in the early 2010s that alleged that the high-pitched tones and binaural beats of Lavender Town's soundtrack caused hundreds of children to commit suicide. Of course, these claims are absolutely not true, but even so, creepy story. I really didn't need to hear that. Thank you very much. Number 6. Pyramid Head's Introduction Silent Hill 2. We've seen video game characters introduced in a wide variety of ways here at Team Triple Jump, but when it comes to making an entrance, there isn't a character out there who's as stomach-turningly petrifying as Pyramid Head. This triangle bonced bloke introduced himself to the video gaming world in 2001's Silent Hill 2, where he debuted as, spoiler alert, the manifestation of James Sunderland's guilt over euthanizing his wife. After receiving a letter from her years later, James travels to the titular Silent Hill in order to try and find her. Once there, however, he runs into a number of nightmares, including the subject of this entry. Whilst on his search, James goes to the Woodside Apartments, where for the first time, he comes across the game's primary antagonist. 
Hiding in a closet, James and the player witness Pyramid Head doing unspeakable things to a pair of mannequins before swiftly slaughtering them. It's a grisly and unsettling sight to behold, and in one stomach-turning sequence perfectly encapsulates the character of Pyramid Head. Later encounters with the knife-wielding menace are also unnerving, but none invoke the sheer terror in the player that the initial one does. I don't care how many letters I'd have received from my dead wife in this situation, I'd be getting myself out of there quicker than you could say, maybe that blade's compensating for something. Number 5. The First Scarecrow Encounter – Batman Arkham Asylum Although Joker is easily the best comic book villain in Rocksteady's Batman Arkham Asylum, he's far from the scariest. That accolade easily goes to the bad doctor, Jonathan Crane, or as he's better known, Scarecrow. Sporting a horrifying patchwork gas mask on his face and multiple massive needles on his hand, just looking at Scarecrow is enough to give players the heebie-jeebies. But throw his proprietary fear toxin into the mix, and you'll be having nightmares for weeks. Throughout the game, poor old Brucey Dubs is subjected to a variety of hallucinations thanks to Scarecrow and his nobody's laughing gas, but the most unnerving is undoubtedly the first. After Bruce descends the asylum in a lift, he comes face to face with some of Crane's victims, trapped in a room and begging for their torment to end, before seeing Commissioner Gordon dragged away by an unseen assailant. By the time he reaches his mustachioed ally, it's too late, and it seems like Gordon has kicked the bucket, though eagle-eyed players will notice that Batman's eyes have gone a funny colour, indicating that something may be amiss. Pushing forwards, he discovers body bags containing his parents who berate him, before Scarecrow gets the jump on him and unleashes a full dose of his fear toxin, trapping bats in a hellish platforming level. Oh no, not platforming, anything but platforming! Number 4. Deleting all of your saves – Eternal Darkness, Sanity's Requiem Sure, it was pretty scary when Psycho Mantis moved your controller across the floor with just the power of his mind, or when Monica was able to tell you your own name, even if you hadn't told it to her. But in our opinion, there is no fourth wall break in all of video gaming quite as terrifying as the one in Eternal Darkness, Sanity's Requiem that threatens to delete all of your saves. Like many other horror games, Eternal Darkness has a sanity mechanic, and so if the player exposes protagonist Alexandra to too many enemies, her mind will begin to fracture. Unlike in many other games, however, where the sanity effects only have a negative impact on the main character, Eternal Darkness also messes with the player. Most of the sanity effects that break the fourth wall in Eternal Darkness are disconcerting in one way or another, but undoubtedly the most terrifying is the one that threatens to delete all of the player's save data. To be clear, the game means all of the save data for every game on the console, not just for Eternal Darkness. You know what? You can come at me with all of the jump scares and gore in the world, but threaten to wipe my precious Resident Evil 4 saves? That's crossing the line. Number 3. The Flooded Room – Amnesia The Dark Descent not only is Amnesia The Dark Descent a game that launched the YouTube careers of a bunch of shrieking gamers, but it's also one of the scariest video games ever made. Well, at least in the opinion of our writer, who still hasn't stopped crying after we made her play it for research for this video. It's been three weeks, cat. Pull yourself together. There are numerous horrifying monsters to be found in Amnesia The Dark Descent, but perhaps the most terrifying is the Kernook, which protagonist Daniel first encounters in the Cellar Archives. This water dwelling creature may be the only one in the game that can actually be killed, but that doesn't mean the player will have an easy time doing so, as they're not just highly ferocious and like to snack on human flesh, but they're also invisible. Oh goody. When Daniel makes his way down to the cellar archives, the shadow will roar, extinguish the candles and then flood the place, which can only mean one thing – it's Kernikan time. What follows is the world's most terrifying game of the floor is lava, and players must guide Daniel through the cellar by having him hop between crates to avoid the bloodthirsty beastie, make a wrong move, and poor old Danny Boy will wind up as the monster's somewhat damp supper. Yep. That settles it. Definitely not venturing down to my cellar this weekend. In fact, I'm just going to set it on fire instead. 
Number two, the Xenomorph appears, Alien Isolation. Although Alien Isolation is a fantastic game, there's just one teeny tiny issue with it. From the get-go, players know that at some point, they will probably have to face a Xenomorph. I know, I know, it's super inconvenient, but what can you do? Now, if you've seen any of the Alien movies, you'll know that a Xenomorph is gosh darn terrifying every time it shows up. What with its acid blood, armored exoskeleton, and that weird mouth thing it does, but they haven't invented a word for how horrifying the thing is when it makes its grand debut in Alien Isolation. So we'll go with super mega uber giga terrifying. The first time the players meet the Xenomorph in the game, it makes itself known by plopping down through a vent, leaving poor Amanda Ripley to cower behind a desk with no option but to hold her breath and simply pray that it goes away. Go away it does, but not before whipping its tail about a bit, as if to toy with the player. Is it really unaware of Amanda's presence? or is it simply playing with its food? You just don't know, and if you've any sense, you won't stick around long enough to find out. Now, before we get to our number one pick, we'd like to remind you that, as we said in the intro, the moment in the top spot isn't necessarily any scarier than the one in the 101 spot. So I don't want to see any of you getting all mad at us in the comments if you think that one of our previous entries is more chilling than our next. Now I've said that though, this one is pretty darn spooky. Number one, the first zombie, Resident Evil. Oh, come on, you didn't think we'd make 97% of the entries on this list picks from the Resident Evil series without including the scare that started it all, did you? What do you take us for? Released in 1996, Resident Evil sees players controlling either the boulder-punching asshole Chris Redfield or the beret-loving Jill Valentine as they explore the Spencer Mansion in order to find out what happened to Star's Bravo Team or Special Tactics and Rescue Service Bravo Team if you want to get final appearance from Simon Miller about this. B-Team aren't just kicking back in the billiard room or munching popcorn in the house cinema though, and have instead had a brush with the mansion's less than savoury… uh… residence? Immediately after arriving in the mansion, Star's Alpha Team split up and players are left to explore the labyrinthine house with their chosen protagonist. However, no sooner have they abandoned their pals, and yes we put pals in quotes there because we all know Wesker sucks, than they're faced with one of the most terrifying sights in all of gaming, a hideous, mutated man that's chowing down on one of their Bravo Team comrades. And in blurry, awful PS1 vision too. Ugh. We're not sure if it's the sight of a zombie munching on a dead colleague, or the slow turn towards the camera that had us utterly cacking ourselves the first time we played the game, but what we do know is that we've never looked at a stately home in the same way since. You never know what dastardly secrets might be being kept by the National Trust. 